requirement provided the notice requirement provided for the open public meeting law has been set satisfied notice was properly given and said notice having been transmitted to the Korea news on January 12th of 2022 as well as the posting in the Korea news web I mean, on the city's website I apologize director I mean Mr. Clark can we have a roll call please council members Davis present McKenna <clears throat> present Hockaday present Mills Ransom present Briggs Jones present Vice President McCray present Council President Good present we have all members present in a quorum, Council President. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, no approval for uh, the minutes, no discussion items. We will jump right into consideration of public hearing and second reading and final passage. Mr. Clark, uh, can you please read MC 2022-35 by title and further certify that the ordinance has complied with all statutory publication requirements, please. MC 2022-35 is an ordinance of the city of Plainfield and the County of Union amending and supplementing the municipal code chapter 17 entitled historic preservation commission and article entitled historic preservation controls. It is hereby certified that the notice of the public, uh, the notice of the public hearing on this ordinance was published in the Courier News on September 16th, 2022. And the floor is now open to any member of the public who would like to speak on this particular uh, ordinance. Hi. Mr. Michaels, good evening. Your Thank name and address for the record, please. Sure, William Michelson, 556 Belvedere Avenue, Chairman of the Historic Pres Preservation Commission. Good evening. Good evening, President Good. Um, I'm not gonna rehash things that I've already talked to you about at recent meetings. I just wanna point out one other interesting uh, way of looking at this. The population of the historic districts is a little over 2,000. I know that because there are 630 properties that are under HPC jurisdiction now. If you add to that people who live around the historic districts or in the expansion area that we've been uh, uh, offering to the city or who associate themselves with the historic districts in some way, you're talking about 5,000 people easily. That's a big item. That's a big part of the population. They don't understand, and I don't understand why you want to hit them in the face like this. At the very least, I think this resolution should be tabled so that I and whoever else wants to uh, involve themselves with it can meet with the mayor and anyone else in the administration that would like to talk to us. This is just a bad idea. I think the council should vote against this resolution or at least table it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Michelson. We appreciate your comment. There's there any more? Mr. DeMarco, good evening. Your name and address for the record, please. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good evening. My name is John DeMarco. I live at 940 Glenwood Avenue in Plainfield. This ordinance will allow your board without the qualified expertise to make inappropriate decisions about the fate of the historic districts in the city and also city owned historic properties. And just a reminder, I hope you all will be attending the Plainfield Haunted House Tour this Saturday. Tickets will be available online and at Swain's Gallery. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeMarco. We appreciate your comment. Uh, someone by the name of Owner, your name and address for the record, please. Good evening. Owner, you're unmuted. Your name and address for the record, please. Can you? We... Yes, I can now. Good evening. How are you? No, I'm well, thank you. Uh, Janelle Michonne, 1410. Evergreen Avenue, I'm calling to voice my objection to the amendments to the Historic Preservation Ordinance. 
The proposed changes will allow planning and zoning to have jurisdiction over historic properties without the expertise that the state municipal land use law requires of HPC commissioners. There is potential for harm to our city's historic districts. Um, and it is very important to the residents who have bought their homes there and worked hard to preserve the, um, the integrity of their homes. Please choose the residents over uncontrolled development and please vote no. And I have one last comment, which is, I haven't heard from the council members. So I don't know who's considering voting yes and who's considering voting no. But I would just like to say that constituents in all the wards are begging you, they are begging you to put Plainfield first and to preserve the best part of our city, which is our, our historic districts. To the council members who will vote yes, I, and I'm sure everyone else on this call, um, looks forward to hearing your reason why you voted yes. Um, if you believe your yes vote will make Plainfield better, then tell us why. It is just the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. We appreciate your comment. Denise Edmonds, good evening. Can we have your name and address for the record, please? Good evening. Uh, this is Denise Edmonds at 975 Hillside Avenue. I have a very short statement. Um, I grew up hearing that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The HPC rules and regulations have helped Plainfield's historic district districts and the city of Plainfield thrive. It ain't broke. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Edmonds. Larry, good evening. Your name and address for the record, please. Um, Larry Quirk, 967 Madison Avenue, Plainfield. I'm the vice chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, I, I wanted to point out to the council that this ordinance originally arose some months ago um, as a, an agenda item only several days before that meeting. Uh, there was no consultation at all with uh, the Historic Preservation Commission or myself or the chairman of that commission. Uh, it just appeared out of nowhere. So there was no effort for, from the city for any input into us if the city felt there was a real problem here, um, how we could uh, either change our practices or maybe uh, alter the ordinance to make both sides happy. Um, it's obviously a train uh, going very quickly downhill um, but it is a really bad idea. Um, you know, the, the council should know that Plainfield has always struggled to rise up. One of the things we have are the great historic districts um, that we are well known for. Once you start allowing uh, developers to do what they want and uh, the zoning commission, the zoning board and the uh, other commission planning board they have different focuses than we do. Uh, their focus uh, is a lot of detail for a lot of different regulations that have nothing to do really with how the building will look when it's finished. Um, and they should put their energies into that. And there's certainly enough work here in the city now with all the development going on uh, to keep them busy for quite some time. Uh, the fact that this proposed ordinance allows us to provide a report, although I saw nothing in there that we would actually have a meeting or a presentation by the developer or uh, anything that might uh, give us details on which we can base our opinion. Um, it's, it's just a report that will be passed on to the zoning and planning board, whichever is appropriate at the time. Uh, they have a lot of other things to be concerned about, and I think historic preservation and how a building would look are pretty low down on their list. That's why we're here. So um, I agree with the, with the comments Mr. Michelson has made here on the other meetings in his letter that he sent to the mayor as well. But I think this is a real mistake. Um, and I would ask the council um, to vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. We appreciate your comment. 
Ms. P. Wara, good evening. Your name and address for the record, please. Uh, yes, Nancy P. Wara, 1129 Myrtle Avenue. I'm good speaking evening. on behalf of myself and no one else. In the HPC ordinance, there are minor changes that I cannot find fault with. However, there are sections that raise a lot of questions and concern. In particular, the removal of the section that pertains to informal hearings will impact residents and nonprofits such as churches, Masonic Temple, and a school in their pocketbook. Among other concerns is the removal of language that pertains to the city council. There are at least three places where the city council is mentioned and it's, and it's X'd out. All of you do so much work and why not have the HPC provide advice when necessary to all of you? Nothing is done in a vacuum, everything is interconnected. Recently, Governor Murphy signed a bill to establish a Black Heritage Trail, and Plainfield has many sites that are potentially eligible for inclusion on this Black Heritage Trail. And I would not want the actions taken in this HPC ordinance to impact any of the potential sites in Plainfield for signage such as Mount Olive Church, Shiloh, Calvary, St. Mark's, and other Black churches, the two Black funeral homes, the Green Book sites, and the homes of famous Black sports figures, and the list goes on. Currently, there are approximately 22 potential New Jersey legislative bills relating to historic preservation, including a bill that could potentially help historic churches architecturally and help residents with tax credits. The representatives in New Jersey refill, refer these bills to committee and I respectfully request that the city council table this HPC ordinance so that a committee of citizens and city representatives can sit down and negotiate a potential better ordinance. Thank you and have a great evening. Thank you, Ms. P. Warren. Mr. Haworth, good evening. Your name and address for the record, please. You're muted, sir. Mr. Haworth. I got there. me now. There we go. Good evening. Yeah, hi. Uh, name uh, and yes, name Greg Hayworth, 1785 mm -hmm. Sleepy Hollow Lane, Plainfield, mm -hmm. New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, I'm calling in to object um, express my objection to the amendment. Um, I've, I've listened, I've been following this. Um, I listened to what Mr. Michelson said and what he said there's 2000 people living in the historic areas. I look at that in some ways another, why would we need to change an ordinance that's directly affecting 2000 people, none of whom have expressed a desire to have the ordinance changed? Um, somebody said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I would like to hear why this is broke, why we are looking at just the historic districts, and isn't there enough property here for developers otherwise, if that's what the city's concern is? And, and so therefore, uh, not having heard anyone within the district posting uh, objection to this, uh, not hearing from anyone on the council why this makes sense, uh, I suggest at a minimum we table this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howarth. Bill Neerstack, good evening. Your name, good evening. And, your name and address, please. My name is Bill Neerstead. I live at 320 Hickory Avenue, Garwood, New Jersey. I greatly appreciate you letting me speak. Um, yes, for those members who are wondering, I am still alive and Plainfield remains dear to my heart. <clears throat> we were wondering, Mr. Neerstead, but go ahead. I, I, hope you, I hope you weren't wondering. I hope you knew it would be. <laughs> um, thank you for that, Councilman. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, as you could guess, I have something prepared, and if you need to cut me off, just let me know. I speak in opposition to this proposed ordinance and ask that City Council not adopt it, but instead send it to the City Historic Preservation Professional to amend it to be in accordance with similar ordinances throughout the state of New Jersey. While there may be items that need to be changed in the current Historic Preservation Ordinance, and, and I don't refute that, this proposal is like using a bulldozer to swat a fly. The entire ordinance boils down to two changes. It administratively gives the planning board the final say over design elements in historic preservation districts and landmark properties. And it removes the requirement that the city of Plainfield be required to obtain a certificate of appropriateness for the city applications in historic districts. There are some who are going to say that that's not what it says, but I will read a little further and it does. I believe that both changes are in error and have far reaching implications that would not bode well for the city nor for its historic districts. 
The current process requires all applicants, including the city, who require land use approval in historic districts to obtain a certificate of appropriateness. The process requires that an application be submitted to the HPC for quote a referral prior to an applicant being heard by the Planning Board or Zoning Board. The HPC is to review the application for its contextual fit, <clears throat> meaning height, bulk, location, et cetera, within the characteristics of the historic district in which it is located, and to recommend that the Planning Board or Zoning Board adopt a condition in any approving resolution requiring the applicant to submit a certificate of appropriateness application to the HPC once your architect has determined all the window, siding, roof, door, trim, and material details. This process has worked well for over 40 years. This ordinance requires the historic preservation, I'm sorry, the proposed ordinance removes the historic preservation commission from making final decisions about architectural details and places that authority with the planning board. With all we do respect to the planning board members, and I love them all, the board is not place to make that decision. The municipal land use law requires an historic preservation commission member to be, quote, knowledgeable in design and construction of architectural history, unquote, and a member who is not, quote, knowledgeable or with a demonstrated interest in local history. The municipal land use law makes no such requirement for any planning board member. The planning board should not be making final architectural decisions for development in historic districts in the city of Plainfield. The current process also requires the city to obtain a certificate of appropriateness for city proposals on city-owned land in historic districts. Some of you may know my <clears throat> Malcolm Dunn story, and that story is where planning board members, historic preservation commission members, and city council members, including Malcolm Dunn, discussed the proposed ordinance years ago, specifically the reference to if, city, if the city is required to obtain a certificate of appropriateness and go to the board like every other quote developer in the city of Plainfield. Councilman Dunn looked around at everyone and said, well, if everyone else has to do it, we should too. And that's the way it's been ever since. I do not believe it is proper for a city to not be responsible, not be required to obtain a CA as everyone else is. That's a president, the speaker's time is up. Thank you, Mr. Neerstadt. Council President. Uh, the, oh, uh, we still have there's some still more. another hand, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, we, yes, that's a couple more. Um, Ian Frazier, good evening. Your name and address for the record, please. Thank you. Uh, Ian Frazier, 747 Dixie Lane. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a prepared uh, statement. Um, it's unfortunate that this administration lacks the vision to develop playing field in a manner that plays to its strengths as an architecturally significant town with endless potential. Um, Asbury Park is doing just that by requiring developers to preserve the facades of buildings in downtown that are slated for redevelopment. Um, Rahway is, I believe, also in the process of establishing an HPC. Uh, the HPC should have more power, not less. It should include interiors of significant commercial buildings such as churches and places of worship. It should also represent the people um, and there should be one member of each or one resident of each historic district on the commission, which there currently isn't. And there are some members who do not live in a historic district, um, which is a lack of representation. Um, also, what I have the biggest problem with is the city's blatant exemption to the HPC ordinance. Uh, this move puts a Plainfield property such as the Drake House and the Quaker Meeting House at risk and at the whims of the city. Uh, this also, um, I think we know that this also implicates the Grace Episcopal Church situation as well as the YMCA situation. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with Bill Michelson's statement and that 2000 um, resident number is actually a significant voting block. In fact, if you look at the results of the last election, uh, that number is most of the votes. So I suggest, um, I'm asking this council to save your votes and your seats and vote no or table this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. Elizabeth Ferrone, good evening. Your name and address for the record, please. Good, good evening, Elizabeth Ferroni, 320 uh, West 38th Street. I, I apologize for, it, for mispronouncing your last name. Oh, that's okay. It's mm -hmm. pronounced many different ways. <laughs> mm 
Okay, so there are many people in Plainfield who would like to preserve irreplaceable, beautiful architecture, and many individual homeowners have been successful in the preservation of their own homes, and local preservationists have created an historic preservation commission in Plainfield. Unfortunately, the MAP administration is not committed to historic preservation. Please do not approve the proposed amendments to the historic preservation ordinance. I envision a future administration that hires an expert in the new field of sustainable preservation in order to guide Plainfield properly. The city can create a department within the planning division entitled sustainable preservation. They can recruit a director who has been educated in sustainable preservation, preferably a graduate from Cornell University who has earned a certificate in sustainable preservation. This director can hire those with expertise in and experience in preservation in New Jersey. The city can hire corporate counsel with expertise in historic preservation and with a commitment to the preservation of Plainfield. I love Plainfield and I don't wanna see it lose its beauty. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Ferroni, have a good night. We appreciate your comment. Good evening, Kathleen N. You're muted. Uh, give us your name and address for the record, please. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Hi, I'm Kathleen Nietzsche. I live at 716 Huntington Avenue in Plainfield. I strongly object to the ordinance change for the HBC and urge you strongly to vote no or table this for a, after doing more um, research. When, I, when people ask me why I stay in Plainfield, and I mentioned it, the first response they say to me is there's so many beautiful homes not any of the other things, they always talk about the beauty of our homes. Historic means anything that's 50 years old or over. That translates into most of the beautiful Plainfield stock, housing stock, not just the historic districts. Please, I urge you so much to stay, say no to the Historic Preservation Commission ordinance, or at least table it. Think about our residents. Don't think about the developers and the planners, that if you let them through, they can take over this town. Think of the one thing that we have different than all these other towns that have apartments or housing stocks. I urge you to vote no for the HPC ordinance changes tonight and vote yes for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nietzsche. We appreciate your comment. Seeing that there are no more uh, that would like to speak upon this ordinance up. Uh, okay, we have one more. Uh, Ms. Lawrenson, good evening. Your name and address for the record, please. Hi, my name is Christian Lawrenson and I live at 308 West 8th. Good evening. Uh, good evening. I also wanted to call in to voice my objections to this HBC ordinance. Um, I live in a historic district. I've gone before the HBC and I've taken their invaluable advice. Um, to me, it's unconscionable that you would want to take away their powers. As a historic district resident, resident, I want the HBC's powers intact and all of my neighbors that I've spoken to feel the same way. Um, and I'd like to reiterate also, these are voting neighbors. Um, I mean, think about the towns that you personally visit on weekends and on vacation and what makes you choose those towns. I know for my family and most of my friends, you know, you go to Cape May because of the beautiful his historic homes. Um, you go to Lambertville because of the historic downtown, New Hope. Even when traveling abroad, you skip the towns that are just, you know, industrial or, you know, just work a day apartment towns, but you bring your money and you spend your money in these historic towns with you know cute cute downtowns that have been preserved and brought back to life in some cases um we can be that there's no reason we can't do that and i think we're at a tipping point right now we have the opportunity to bring plainfield back to life the bones are all there downtown we just have to focus on that and not waste and squander this opportunity that we have to bring money in through tourism um you know, we can have B&Bs in these beautiful old houses, things like that, once you get the cute downtown back. Um, so I would just like to, to also beg you, please don't vote to take away the HPC's powers. We need them. A lot of us moved here specifically for these historic homes. We're putting a lot of work into these historic homes, a lot of time, a lot of money. We care about them and we care about this town. And I think this is just a really short-sighted mistake that is destroying our biggest asset instead of using it to our advantage. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lawrenson. Jeff Jefferson Moon, good evening. Your name and address for the record, please. 
Uh, you're muted, sir. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good evening. Your name and address, please. My mm -hmm. name is Jefferson Moon. I live at 326 Beechwood Avenue in Haddonfield, an historic town in southern New Jersey. But I grew up in Plainfield and went to Washington, Maxson, and Plainfield High School. I'm also an architect who does historic buildings. Uh, and I uh, called because I felt compelled to plead with you to consider keeping the historic commission because I served on our historic commission in Hanfield and I've always thought back to Plainfield and how beautiful it was in all the historic districts. And uh, I, I've seen what it ha has done for Haddonfield down in South Jersey near Cherry Hill. And I think Plainfield would do itself well by keeping the historic districts and being actually kind of strict, if you could, because that is what will preserve the natural uh, beauty of Plainfield. I can't emphasize it enough. It, it really is very important. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Have a good night. Motion to close public hearing on this ordinance. Move. You have another comment. Oh, never mind. So move. I need a second, okay. please. Uh, I believe, uh, uh, well, motion on this ordinance, uh, the public comment is closed for this particular ordinance. And I believe that Director Jackson had something to say when she thought that we didn't have any more comments. Uh, you have the floor, Director. Uh, yes, I don't normally do. Um, I heard the motion in the second, but I didn't hear the vote in order to close public comment. Council President, uh, the councilwoman is correct. We need to have a vote first, and then uh, you can turn to the to the director. If you my apologies, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilwoman Davis, for noting that. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Davis. Yes. McKenna. No. Hockaday. Yes. Mills Ransom. Yes. Briggs Jones. Yes. Vice President McCray. Yes. Council President Good. Yes. Public hearing on this ordinance has been closed. Director Jackson, go right ahead. Uh, yes. Thank you, Council President. I don't normally do this on a second reading of an ordinance, but because it's been a long time since we introduced this particular ordinance, I wanted to remind council of a couple of things. Uh, this ordinance uh, creates better efficiencies. It, the amendments that are proposed don't impact homeowners at all, meaning that homeowners in historic districts will continue to go before the HPC for a certificate of appropriateness. So Director Jackson, will you say that last part again? So <laughs> homeowners mm -hmm. will continue mm -hmm. to go before the HPC related to their properties and improvements mm -hmm. to those properties in historic districts. What this does change is that when there is a site plan, meaning a project, that is greater than a single family home or even a two family home for that matter, that that site plan goes before one of our boards. It goes before the planning board or the zoning board. And in our own ordinance, it says that the HPC makes recommendations to those boards related to historic districts. And what is wrong in our ordinance is that today, before somebody can get a permit, after they've gotten all their planning board approval, approvals, before it's codified in a resolution, uh, after it's codified in a resolution by the planning board or the zoning board, they have to go back to HPC and get a C of A before they can get a permit. And so we're reconciling these issues. The HPC will continue to have input on site plans, but what we are forcing is more discipline where they have to issue a report that explains the design recommendations 
to the appropriate board and that their consultant, which is a consultant to the city as well as to the HPC, sits in on technical review committee meetings like a number of our other groups do and advise applicants before they have their final submission of their site plan. So, and as it relates to the city, uh, the city will adhere to all state guidelines related to its historic properties. That is not what we're questioning here. What we are talking about is facilitating the process. So if the city does something like North Avenue Pedestrian Mall, we have to go to the state to get that approval. Of course, we're gonna to go to our own local board as well. And so that's property that the city on is something, if there was a change in city hall on, on the structure, we would have to still go to the state and also we would go to the Historic Preservation Commission in that particular case. So we're simplifying. And for those of you who have not been to an HPC meeting, when there is a site plan before them, I invite you to be there because the HPC, if they stuck to design and historical architecture, that would be appropriate. But we have people going before them, including the city, not dealing with design, but operational issues, parking issues, uh, trash site plan issues, things that are addressed by other boards and are in the purview of other boards. I've been here four and a half years, and I must say, if you haven't been to one of those meetings, you should attend so you can see what I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Director Jackson. Uh, that being said, may I have a motion to adopt this? Council ordinance? President, I actually, it's a council meeting, so council members usually get opportunity to talk. I'm much aware that this is a meeting. Uh, I, I believe you should have said that you have something to say, and that I would have, have been appropriate. Okay, well, would you go right ahead then? Excellent. So I appreciate what Ms. Jackson said, and, and as is often the case, uh, the, the propaganda points that she brought up at the beginning of her talk probably would have worked better if she hadn't added that little part at the end about how frustrating HPC meetings are. I've been to HPC meetings many, many times. They can be frustrating. Um, I've been to planning board meetings because I was on planning board for eight years. Those can be frustrating because developers can be frustrating. Uh, architects can be frustrating. Lawyers can be frustrating. Uh, economic development directors can be frustrating. What I want to point out here is this does impact homeowners. It doesn't impact them directly by their applications in their historic districts. It impacts them because you're meddling with historic commercial downtown areas uh, and taking that out of HPC's purview. So when those areas fail to improve, that affects uh, home values, that affects homeowners. Um, <clears throat> the fact that this has issues up, up against municipal land use law and historic preservation laws uh, is, is obvious, it, it completely does. There's issues with uh, certified local government um, approval that we, we would have issues. You can shake your head, but I've had conversations with the state. They've got issues with it, especially because we do not in our master plan have a historic preservation element. Everybody keeps talking about how it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, but somehow we get developers in front of this stuff, but we can't get our historic preservation element done, which by the way has been done because the HPC did it long ago. Um, the fact that we have, are, we're also changing, removing members uh, by either the administration or the council. The council approves appointees. It's advice and consent of the council. So the council in every other situation removes appointees for cause after if there's what they, and if they want to have a public hearing. So to change that is also a little dubious and a little weird. This is very, this is very developer leaning. This is very much to keep the city from having to have commotion and, and extra work because you're, you're not always winning. So that's, I could see your frustration. Um, and I think the city should be beholden to the same rules as everybody else because what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And the HPC is made up of citizens. So if citizens are gonna be told that they have to do certain things based on ordinances and rules, 
the city ought to abide by them as well, except for extraneous extenuating circumstances like um, handicapped accessibility and emergency access, et cetera, et cetera. That's all open to, to conversation. I would say right now that I am making a motion to table this ordinance until it has been reviewed by the state historic board and, uh, and another an outside attorney to see how it it uh, bumps up and and conflicts with municipal land use and historic preservation. So that's my motion. Second. All in favor? I think you have to have a roll call. We need a roll call. Roll call on the motion to table. Council members Briggs Jones. Yes. Davis. Yes. Hockaday. No. McKenna. Yes. Mills Ransom. No. Vice President McCray. No. Council President Good. No. Three in favor, four opposed. The motion to table fails. May I have a motion to adopt this ordinance on second reading and final passage, and if adopted, the ordinance shall be published as required by law. So moved. Second. Second it. I have a roll call, Mr. Clerk. Council President, I'd like to make some comments. Sure, Councilman Hockaday, go right there's ahead. A motion. <laughs> Who's a motion second? There, there is, there's a motion and a second on the floor. Who's moved and seconded, the, the roll call didn't begin, he can make his comments. Go right ahead, Councilman Hockaday. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to, you know, re respect the wishes of some of the residents in terms of what, uh, what I'm thinking in terms of uh, approving this motion um, or, the, or this, uh, this ordinance change. Um, for, I, I don't view this change as, as, a, as a huge change. Um, there were some comments made and it seems like there's just a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, there's some residents that think that we're disbanding the HPC altogether, for example. Uh, so I, I think that there is a lot of uh, misguided uh, furor over uh, this change, this ordinance change, which which I believe to be, I think uh, you know Bill Neerstadt summarized it pretty pretty succinctly. You know, in terms of uh, just taking the city out from uh, underneath the final authority of the HPC. Um, there was also some statements that I that I made. Well, they, they mentioned uh, count, former Councilman Dunn, where he indicated that if Plainfield, if if everybody else has to do it, then Plainfield should do it. Well, the you know the county and the state doesn't have to do it, you know, and so really there are the entities that do not do it, but Plainfield does, and it seems that they're only taking the city and putting it with the county and the state and with respect to its relationship with the HPC. So to me, I think it's a relatively minor change, you know, for the residents, you know, they're still gonna follow the same process. Uh, and, and I, I, you know, I, I care deeply about how Plainfield looks. I don't think anything, uh, especially it's, it's historic districts. I don't think that's gonna change with the change of this ordinance, you know, and, um, you know, so that's why I'm going to support the ordinance. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Hockaday. Mr. Clark, can we have a roll call? Council members Briggs Jones. No. Councilwoman Davis. No. Councilman Hockaday. Yes. Councilman McKenna. No. Councilwoman Mills Ransom. Yes. Vice President McCray. Yes. Council President Good. Yes. It's four in favor, three opposed. This ordinance has been adopted on second reading and final passage. Ms. Clark, can you please read MC 2022-44 by its title and further certify that the ordinance has complied with all the statutory publication requirements. MC 2022-44 is an ordinance of the city of Plainfield County of Union, New Jersey adopting the East 3rd and Richmond Street Redevelopment Plan dated August 18th, 2022. It is hereby certified that notice of the public hearing on this ordinance was published in the Courier News on September 16th, 2022. And the floor is now open to any member of the public who would like to speak on this particular ordinance. 
seeing that there are none, I may have a motion to close the public hearing on this ordinance. Moved. Seconded. Mr. Clerk. Don't we need a roll call? No. You moved to close. Uh, I'm, oh, I, I apologize. Okay. Uh, may I have a motion to adopt this ordinance on second reading and final passage, and if adopted, the ordinance shall be published as required by law. Point of order. Do we vote to close the meeting, or do we just get a motion in a second again? Just the motion. There's a motion in a second. All you need, Council Presidents, so all those in favor, and then we can move on. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. May I have a motion to adopt the ordinance on second reading and final passage and adopt it? Second. <laughs> Mr. Clerk? Council members Briggs Jones? Yes. Davis? No. Hockaday? Yes. McKenna? No. Mills Ransom? Yes. Vice President McCray? <clears throat> Council President Good. Yes. That is unanimous. This ordinance has been, I mean, that is not unanimous. It's uh, five in favor to oppose the ordinance has been adopted on second reading and final passage. Mr. Clerk, can you please read MC 2022-45 by its title and further certify that the ordinance has complied with all statutory publication requirements, please. MC 2022-45 is an ordinance of the city of Plainfield, County of Union, New Jersey, adopting the West Front Street and Clinton Avenue redevelopment plan dated August 18th, 2022. It is hereby certified that the notice of the public hearing on this ordinance was published in the Courier News on September 16th, 2022. The floor is now open to any member of the public who would like to speak on this particular ordinance. Now would be your time. With there being none, we have, a mo uh, we have Kathleen Kathleen, your name and address for the record again, please. Sure, it's Kathleen Nietzsche. I'm at 716 Huntington Avenue in Plainfield on the west side of town. And I am so thrilled that there are new businesses on that corner of West Front and Clinton to go through and get a cup of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts after living here all my life has been nothing but a pleasure. And I'm hoping that with this redevelopment plan, you consider those new, those relatively new businesses that are sparking good life and good developments for our people on the west side of town. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. With there being none, no more, may I have a motion to close this public hearing on this ordinance? Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. May I have a motion to adopt this ordinance on second reading and final passage? And if adopted, the ordinance shall be published as required by law. Moved. Second. Okay. Mr. Clark, please. Council members Briggs Jones? Yes. Davis? No. Hockaday? Yes. McKenna? No. Mills Ransom? Yes. Vice President McCray? Yes. Council President Good? Yes. Five in favor to oppose. This ordinance has been adopted on second reading and final passage. Mr. Clark, please read MC 2022 46 title and further. Certify that the ordinance has complied with all the statutory publications and requirements, please. MC 2022-46 is an ordinance of the city of Plainfield and the County of Union adopting the TODD South Redevelopment Plan Amendment dated August 18th, 2022. It is hereby certified that notice of the public hearing on this ordinance was published in the Courier News on September 16th, 2022. The floor is now open to any member of the public who would like to speak on this ordinance. Mr. Neerstadt, good evening again. Can we just please still have your name and address for the record? <laughs> good evening again, 320 Hickory Avenue, Garwood. Um, thank you for letting me speak. I just learned about this um, ordinance today, literally at a quarter to five, so I guess the members are lucky I didn't have time to prepare anything. Um, the bottom line here is, um, and Mr. Mayor, I'm going to actually um, direct this um, um, towards you in a sense of when I retired, one of the things you had said was that everything I, um, so many things in Plainfield had my imprint on them and that um, 
Uh, and I personally was proud of, of your statement. I, I was glad that you said it. Um, I would say to you that I do not think you would be proud of this proposed ordinance. What it's doing is introducing uh, commercial development into what has been a longstanding residential historic district. I do not know if every council member has read every line of the ordinance. I have not. I, as I said, I learned about it two hours ago. So my understanding of it, and I, I am very familiar with the uh, introductory part of it because I have spoken to the developer about this when I was employed in the city of Plainfield. And the idea of um, including the property fronting on 7th in the TODD South plan makes a lot of sense. I spoke to Valerie about that when I was there. I would support that 100%. But including the property that's within the Crescent Area Historic District into the TODD South, I want the members to understand, and, and Mr. Mayor, I appreciate your understanding also, that this introduces the potential for a 10, if I understand this right, a 10-story development within the Crescent Area Historic District because that is what the TODD South redevelopment plan permits. So therefore someone could propose it. If I'm off a couple of stories, we can go six stories. Either way, it's adjacent to one and a half, two and a half story, one, two, three family homes. I'm sorry, this is inconsistent, not only with the city master plan, which calls for the protection of historic districts, but it's inconsistent with every zoning plan that we have ever adopted, uh, the council has ever adopted, which calls for the protection of residential areas, protection of existing densities, and not introduction of high density development into residential areas. And the introduction of this TODD South redevelopment plan into a historic district, to be very honest with you, very unprofessionally, I'm gonna say, just blows my mind. I'm flabbergasted that this is what the city and the map administration is proposing because, and again, if I understand it correctly, I have not read it. I was told about it this afternoon, all right? If the TODD South map extends to include one property on Crescent Area Historic District mapping, then I apologize. This is totally incorrect, inconsistent, every in word I can think of. Um, I encourage council not to consider this one iota, send this back to the planning board, see if indeed the city should advance development on the scale of TODD South onto right, Crescent right, Avenue. Speaker's, speaker's time is up. And I thank you very much. Please oppose this. Uh, council President, this thank, thank, is thank you, Mr. Neustadt. Go, go right ahead, Director Jackson. This ordinance has nothing to do with TODD South. And I believe this ordinance was introduced by finance. Point uh, of order, we haven't closed of, public comment yet. Exactly. I have a motion to close public comment on this particular ordinance, please. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Council President, could the a motion, clerk, read the mo ordinance again, real quick. Mo 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 motion carries. Uh, Director Jackson, can you please repeat what you said uh, again? The, or the ordinance that is up right now is about uh, what's introduced by the tax, I believe, finance, the tax assessor, about contiguous uh, undersized lots and offering those to property owners. That is not the ordinance no. we're talking about. Oh, okay. On ordinance 46. It's an ordinance oh, the uh, adopting the TODD South redevelopment plan. Oh, okay. That one, uh, let me explain. <laughs> Ooh, okay, a couple of things here. Um, this ordinance, uh, uh, for your information, uh, takes the properties that are currently known as 700 Park, PPAC, uh, the Plainfield Performing Arts Center, and other properties and makes them, uh, it addresses them in a redevelopment plan. You've already designated them as areas 
in, as areas in need of redevelopment. You also did the same thing for 140-146 7th. Uh, and on 7th is a property that is very derelict. And what uh, is being done here is including those properties into the TODD South uh, redevelopment area. So uh, just for clarification, that's what we're talking about here. You've already approved them as areas in need of redevelopment. And this is the redevelopment plan that defines the zoning for those areas. Thank you. Council President, I have a comment, question. Go, go right ahead, uh, Councilman McKenna. Yeah, so I think what's what's really interesting is the I'm going to try to do this without swearing is the ridiculous amount of spin coming out of the administration. What Valerie Director Jackson is saying has some truth in it. What Director Jackson failed miserably because she didn't want to bring it up is that these standards, these bulk standards in the TODD South, when the TODD South for residents to get an understanding was primarily created behind the YMCA. So west of Wachong, uh, north of, of Seven. That was the, the TODD South, that whole area back there. There were, several, there were several elements to it. It gradually, the density started to reduce as it went west towards the firehouse. It had different elements within it. It was a great plan. Higher density, but behind the Y, tailed off as you got towards residential. That's how development works when you get towards residential. What Director Jackson is saying, and it's so embarrassing to me that she is just glossing over this, is that the TODD South bulk standards now pop over 7th and they pick up that derelict property on 7th, that she's right about that. That's not necessarily an issue there. Could have a little debate over that, but by and large, not a problem. It then takes the property behind that derelict property, which is on Crescent, in the Crescent District. So right in the middle of the Crescent District, if you're looking at your little monopoly board, you're gonna have all these cute little houses in a historic district, and you're gonna put a 10 story, can be a six story building in the middle of these near Crescent Church and permitted uses for those are, and I brought it up at the last council meeting, restaurants, theaters, bars, taverns, and nightclubs, in addition to some other things. So you are totally, it, you're molesting the historic district by jumping behind that 7th Street property and the fact that you played that spin game and included all these other elements, which actually kind of makes sense to include into it, but they, it doesn't make sense to jump into the historic district. And it's really kind of embarrassing. And I, I have to say, I'm kind of sad to say this, but I'm glad you're retiring too, because that's embarrassing. That's I'm not debating with you, Councilman, and I will uh, not tolerate yeah, this disrespect. Order. This is a council, 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 council meeting. Order, order, please. This is a council meeting, a and, and, an and you can ask to be, you can ask cannot do is talk about Councilman McKenna, you've said your piece. Now, Director Jackson, will you please go right ahead and finish? What I'm going to say is that it's inappropriate. I strongly suggest possible? that everyone calm down. Okay, Before I'm calming down, but mm -hmm. I will not sit in a meeting and be disrespected personally by anyone, including Councilman McKenna. Well, then don't lie. Okay. Council President, if, if I may just make a recommendation. Go uh, right ahead. Go ahead, Council. That, that we can all have disagreements on policy, but that we should all refrain from any personal attacks about anyone's, uh, about anyone's job. For anyone personally, as was done this evening, and I, I think, think we can all and we I, can disagree without doing that. That's my and, recommendation. And, 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 and I also, I also see no reason why we have to be disrespectful. I believe you could get your point across, Councilman McKenna, and you do that, and you do it sometimes very well. All right. But, Council President, your but, point, but, but, your point but, is but, taken, but, but, but I'm not going to have the director lying to the public. I'm not. Okay, and, and, I, and, and I understand. That's disrespectful. But, but, but You're the, the one lying also, to the public. It was also disrespectful for you to make that comment. No. So now we're going to move on. May, I have a motion to adopt this ordinance on second reading. Are you going to ask for any other, any other council comments? I mean, Valerie Jackson gets 18 attempts to speak and other council members don't even get asked if they want to. Uh, okay. the council, council President, you have the right to ask for a motion. That is your right as council president. I believe, I believe enough has been said, especially from Councilman McKenna, 
But if there is another council member who would like to say something without being disrespectful, which I'm sure we have some here, because I'm going to tell you something, this is really out of control sometimes. And it's not necessary. It's not warranted at no time. We are supposed to be professionals. And at no time do we throw stones and hit people in the face oh, in, the middle, oh. in the middle of a council meeting. So that being said, may I have a motion okay. to have to adopt this ordinance on second reading and final passage. And if adopted, the ordinance shall be published as required by law. Well moved. Second. All in favor? Roll call. Roll call, please, Mr. Clark. Please, please, please. Very special members, Briggs Jones. No. Councilwoman Davis. No. Councilman Hockaday. Yes. Councilman McKenna. Absolutely not. Councilwoman Mills Ransom. Yes. Vice President McCray. Yes. Council President Good. Yes. Four in favor, three opposed, or instead been adopted on second reading and final passage. If you would, Mr. Clerk, please read MC 2022-47 by its title and further certify that the ordinance has complied with all the statutory publication and requirements, please. MC 2022-47 is an ordinance authorizing the sale of various city-owned properties less than the minimum lot size to the contiguous property owner who submits the highest bid pursuant to NJSA 48 colon 12 dash 13. It is hereby certified that the notice of public hearing on this ordinance was published in the Courier News on September 16th, 2022. The floor is now open to any member of the public who would like to speak on this particular ordinance. And I believe we have one. Mr. Gagliotti, good evening, sir. You're muted. Your name and address for the record, please. You're muted, sir. <laughs> Mr. Gagliani, we can't hear you. You're muted. You need to unmute yourself. I've sent multiple requests to unmute himself. Um, for now, I would say we could remove him as a speaker. He might have accidentally rose his hand. Thank you. I appreciate that. If there are no more, may I have a motion to close the public hearing on this particular ordinance? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? The motion carries. Now, may I have a motion to adopt this ordinance on second reading and final passage? And if it's adopted, the ordinance shall be published as required by law. Move. Second. Mr. Clark, please. Council members Briggs Jones. Yes. Davis. Yes. Hockaday. Yes. McKenna. Yes. Mills Ransom. Yes. Vice President McCray. Yes. Council President Good. Yes. That is unanimous. This ordinance has been adopted on second reading and final passage. We now move to public comment limited to resolutions and motions and ordinances to be introduced on their first reading. A total of 30 minutes has been allocated for public comments limited to resolutions and ordinances being considered this evening. If you wish to be heard, please hit the hand icon to be recognized and you will be unmuted. And once you have been unmuted, please give your name and address for the record, each speaker will be given three minutes. The floor is now open. Remember, each speaker will be given 30 minutes. There being any? Ah, yes, we do. We have one. David M. Good evening, sir. Your name and address for the record? David Martinek. 67 Washington Avenue, Morristown, New Jersey. I'm sorry, I missed this. I just want, is this for a specific ordinance or a general? general com public comments limited to resolutions and motions and, and ordinances on their first reading. Oh, uh, no, I'm sorry. I think I'm later in the agenda. 
Okay. Thank you. Ms. Pewar, good evening again. Your name yeah, and address uh, for the record again. Nancy Pewar, 1129 Merle Avenue. I, I just want to ask a question about MC 2022-48, the cannabis ordinance, um, the maximum number of facilities. Is there a reason why we're increasing the number of facilities? Uh, why the city would want to do that? As someone who's lived in this town all my life, um, it's very disconcerting to me that I walk the streets of this town when there were drug dealers on this town. I live next to drug dealers. They're no longer here. Um, they were the illegal drug dealers. It's really disheartening to me as someone that did that and did protests and things like that, that we're now legalizing drugs in this town. I know that the constitution was changed and that a lot of citizens want it, but I don't understand why can't we keep it the minimum number that you already had? Why do we have to increase the number? Um, also, I think that there's people in jail that should be let out of jail for the marijuana um, and recently, if you look back in articles, there are people that did other illicit drugs that are now in jail. But it's really disheartening to me as someone that walked the streets of this town, Clinton in front, where you're putting a cannabis place legally. It, it's really disheartening to me that I spent so many years, 28 years, pounding the pavement of this town, walking past drug dealers, and now we're going to have quote, legitimate drug dealers. And I don't see any reason why we need to increase the number. Leave it as it is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pewar. With there being no more, I need a motion to close public comment, please. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Public comment is closed. Are there any questions on resolutions R340 22 through R346 22? Yes. Go right ahead, Councilwoman Davis. Um, I think these are great resolutions that we have uh, on the agenda right now. Um, for, I have a question about the audit. Usually we have to come in and physically sign it. Are we going to have to do that again this year? Um, but I also have one item to include under legislative items. I have one item to add. Um, last meeting ended in a bit of a chaos and I'll take responsibility for my portion of that chaos, but it has been too long that this council has been having virtual meetings. We go out and we do the things that we wanna do. We go to concerts, conferences, and uh, comedy shows with no problems. We are doing things in the community, massless. We are outside doing whatever we need to do. So I move that the council return to in-person meetings beginning November, 2022 with an hybrid option for the <laughs> and attendees. Second. Mr. Clark, I need a roll call on that. I need a roll call on that. That motion would come in the form of resolution. Um, and that would be numbered. Resolution 367. Roll call on the motion to add requires two thirds votes to be added to the agenda. Council members Briggs Jones? Yes. Davis? Yes. Hockaday? Yes. McKenna? Yes. Mills Ransom? Yes. Vice President McCray? Oops, man. Council President Good. Yes. Five in favor, one abstention. I'm sorry, uh, six in favor and one abstention. Uh, that motion passes to be added to the agenda. Mr. Clark, what number is that motion? 367. Uh, I move that we adopt resolutions R340-22 to R347-22. Uh, 367. 367, I'm sorry. A point of order. Uh, it said it's 340-22 through R346-22. Wait, okay. I yeah. move that we adopt 
resolutions R340-22, uh-huh. R346-22, and R367-22. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any a roll opposed? call on that. We need a roll call. Council members Briggs Jones. Yes. Davis. Yes. Hockaday. Yes. McKenna. Yes. Mills Ransom. No. Vice President McCray. No. Council President Good. No. Four in favor, three opposed. Those items have been approved. Council President. Yes, Mayor. Under the rules of order of the governing body, um, resolutions that are lumped together as in a consent agenda have to be approved by a unanimous vote of the governing body. And those are your own rules of order. That has never been brought up before. And Clark, point of order, why is the mayor introducing uh, Robert's rules and procedure? We have an attorney for that. Because the mayor has every right to speak at a council The mayor is a guest Read at your charge. The mayor is a guest. Point of order, Read please. The please, point of order. Read the charge. you're a guest. You're welcome to attend them. You don't have Read a vote. Read the charge. Read it all the time. Well, you should Mr. again. M- because M- you- Please mute, unmute Mr. Mancello, please. Mr. Mancello, please. Thank you, Council President. Um, a couple of things I heard, um, and I think this has come up several times. Under our charter, the mayor has the right to uh, participate in the meetings. Um, that is specifically spelled out in our charter. So the mayor interjecting on any matter that comes before the governing body is perfectly permissible. Um, and the mayor has to follow the same rules that any council member would find, just as long as he has the, uh, you know, if he has the approval of the chair, meaning yourself, council president, to speak. He may speak, as every council member does. And I believe the mayor has always referred to you, council president, before he makes his remarks. Mr. So Michelle, how so, so how have, should we proceed? Your recommendation. Uh, I am not aware, so the so I just want to clarify that point first. That the mayor is a speaking member. The only difference between the mayor and a member of council is that he has no vote. Mr. Uh, Clark, he may participate. Jump in, uh, please. As for the the question of the unanimous vote, I am not aware of any rule that requires uh, a unanimous vote on items done in block voting. Um, that uh, as as was done by the councilwoman. Um, but I certainly will review that matter with the mayor and with council in advance of the next meeting because there may be a rule that I uh, am not aware of uh, that requires us to do so. But I, as as based on our past practice, I am not aware of that requirement. So if um, I could if, if I could just add to that, yeah. uh, Council President, um, in, in the past we've had agenda fixing session meetings, and mm-hmm. the items that were routine and non controversial were brought over to the. Uh, regular meeting, and there was a con, uh, consent agenda that was formulated from that. Uh, in which case, any member, the rules stated, any member of the governing body or member of the public technically could pull anything off of the consent agenda. But I, I also, um, to the Corporation Council's point, can't think of any rule that says that in order to approve the consent agenda that it has to be unanimous. But I believe that we should allow um, Mr. Michello, the opportunity to, to review that, but I, I don't know of any rule that allows that, that, that requires that rather. With both of you saying what you have said, where does that leave us now? The consent agenda has been approved. Yes, I agree. I agree with the clerk, yes. Wow. Mr. Clark, how do we proceed? We, the consent agenda items have been approved. We move on to resolution 347. Okay. 
Resolution 347, seeking authorization to extend the consulting services for Ronald E. West. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, I see that uh, Mr. West, the, the, rational, the rationale for extending his contract is uh, because he has some very important administrative matters to um, help the city with. But my concern is, um, Council President, I think there's some feedback from you, Mike. Not mine. I, I believe it is. Um, so my concern is that Mr. West uh, has retired on his own accord, but yet he's coming back to consult with the city. And it's just a little concerning to me that we're bringing people back after they have decided to retire. Uh, I have been muted and I still, I still heard the feedback, so it wasn't me. That's fine. Did you hear what I said? Yes, I did. And that was the most important part. I can speak to it. Go right ahead. <clears throat> okay, so, so Mr. West retired, but not in the definition of a PERS retirement or a PFR or, you know, a pension retirement. He just, he, he's not collecting a pension. So I just want to make that clear because I know that there's that six month rule where you leave, you leave municipal government, you get a, a pension and then you can't come back for six months. So I want to clarify that he's not in violation of that. He's not a PERS retiree. He didn't collect a pension upon retirement. But the second thing that I want to talk about is that Mr. West was intimately involved with many of my projects as BA, which as everybody knows, Mr. West was often involved in many things that weren't necessarily within the direct purview of the director of finance. And so I, it's, it's my resolution because I'm the one who wants to keep him on board until we close out these things we were working on, specifically the one that is the most important to me is that he's working directly with me on all of the union contracts. The union contracts, as you probably know, only two of them have settled. We still have many more to go. And there is a lot of budget forecasting involved in that. There's a lot of different analyses that need to be done multiple times a week. And so he's my right hand there. Um, and then also he's involved in a lot of other projects like the fleet project, those 20, well, up to 21 new vehicles that we just uh, had on the agenda, I think last month, but maybe two months ago from Enterprise. So until those projects are completed, I'd like him to stay on board with me. He's already been here two months, so it's four more months. It means that early 2023, he'd be coming, you know, he'd, he'd be exiting. But this allows him to finish out the projects that he started with me. Are there any more questions? If not, do we have a motion? I have a question. Go right ahead. It's more more of a clarification. I know we budgeted uh, overlap. So with uh, with Director West, I believe Director Jackson in economic development has an overlap. Um, I don't know if if Mr. Neerstead did, but it, his first two months were part of that overlap, or did he have? Okay, so so we he had used budgeted our, that money. We had budgeted that, and even this, we did budget. It's in my outside consulting, uh, in personnel. Like we we had thought about this. It, it is budgeted. It is all budgeted money. But obviously, since it's over the threshold, we we're coming forward with it. Okay. So he used the the was the first one. The first two months were paid as a consulting, or would he just stayed on the payroll? No, he didn't stay on the payroll. He's off payroll. Oh, so he's the first two months overlap was. Paid as a if he was on payroll, then he would be benefits eligible, and he's not benefits eligible because he's retired. Oh, okay, I, I was under the impression that two month thing that and that Mr. West did and and Miss Jackson have that we budgeted for their roles was that they stayed on payroll for two more months while their replacement was also on the payroll. So what we're doing is they're they're leaving and going off the books and then we're doing a consulting for those two. You know, what's happening with Director West and Director Jackson are two so totally different things because Director Jackson is a PERS retiree. She's retiring in the traditional sense of the word. Okay. Through you know municipal government. But Miss Director West is is a different circumstance. I got you. That makes sense then. Okay, thank you. No problem. I need a motion and a second. A motion to approve um, 
R347-22 through R348-22. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Any, any opposed? I'm opposed. Any abstaining? Do we need a roll call, Mr. Clark? I got uh, six in favor, one opposed by Councilman Davis. Uh, Council President, you have a, a slight issue. Please tell me what it is. Resolution 00522, uh, Councilmanic Resolution Establishing Procedures for the Use of the Consent Agenda for the calendar year 2022. Uh, the following procedures shall govern the use of the City Council, the Consent Agenda. Number four, the Consent Agenda shall be adopted by a unanimous vote of the City Council members present at the meeting. Therefore, the Consent Agenda items have failed. So uh, at this point, it, it could be recommended that uh, a, a new motion be made or they be voted on individually. Council, Council President, I, I might make a recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that the item that had, that was not unanimous was the item that was added by Councilwoman Davis. I, I suggest that we do the consent agenda and then vote on that separately. I think that may alleviate the problem. Well, we don't know that for sure. So I think we should vote on them individually. I'm, I'm a council president. I was merely making a legal recommendation to you as your council, uh, but as you as the council president have the authority as to how you wish to run the votes of your meeting. So the vote that was uh, the the one that was in question, uh, Mr. Jallo? Well, I, th they were all grouped together as a consent agenda and the consent agenda has to be unanimous in accordance with the rules and it was not therefore the entire consent agenda failed so in essence we have the legislative body list of resolutions that still needed to be voted on and then we have r367-22 which was added to the agenda and approved so that needs to be voted on correct so we can either do r6722 and then the others in consent or whatever correct 67 motion to approve r67-22 Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Get, like a roll roll call. Call. get, get a roll call, uh, AJ, please. This is resolution R367, uh, allowing the council to go back to in-person meetings. Council members Briggs Jones. Yes. Davis. Yes. Hockaday. No. McKenna. Yes. Mills Ransom. No. McCray. Oh. Was that a no? No. Council President Good. No. It's three in favor, four opposed. That resolution fails. Now still under consideration are resolutions 340 through 346. May I have a, 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 a motion to approve, to, please? I move that we approve uh, R340-22. Through R346-22. No, no I, I said what I said, just the one. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Well, his is a second. Okay. All in, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? It carries. Council President, just just to answer a, a question that Councilwoman Davis had uh, prior to the uh, prior to the vote regarding mm -hmm. the signage of the um, of the audit. Mm -hmm. group affidavit. Yes, all the city council members will have to sign a group affidavit and it has to be sent down to the Division of Local Government Services. Thank you. Can you proceed with uh, the remaining resolutions, please? Resolution 341 is a councilmanic resolution recognizing October as National Breast Cancer Awareness Month introduced by Council President Barry Good. May I have a motion? So all in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? Uh, in abstaining, motion carries. Mr. Clerk. Resolution 342-22, uh, 
honoring the life and legacy of Bishop, Bishop Herbert Bright Sr. introduced by Council President Barry Good. Motion. Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, any opposed, any abstaining? Motion carries. Mr. Clerk. Resolution 343-22 in recognition of Ruth Fellowship Ministries anniversary introduced by Councilman Sean McKenna. I'll make a motion. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Mr. Clerk. Resolution 344-22 in support of Assembly Bill Number 793 and Senate Bill 1427, allowing family members, low income bidders, and community nonprofits to purchase foreclosed homes, introduced by Councilwoman Terry Briggs Jones. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? The motion carries. 345 22 Councilmanic Resolution honoring the life and legacy of Jean Bradshaw Curry, introduced by the unanimous council. I need a motion. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Mr. Clerk. Resolution 346 22 recognizing and congratulating the honorees of the 2022 Plainfield Area NAACP 80th Annual Richard L. Taylor NAACP Freedom Funds Award introduced by the unanimous governing body. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Mr. Clerk, please carry on. We're at resolution 348-22, authorizing the execution of a trust and indemnity agreement between the city of Plainfield and the public entity joint insurance fund. Council members, uh, are there any questions? Do we have a motion? Motion. Move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Mr. Clerk, I believe we're at 349. 349 off, authorizing the execution of an addendum with the county uh, with the Union County Utilities Authority to the MRF agreement with the entity formerly known as the Plainfield Municipal Utilities Authority. Colleagues, any questions? If there be none, may I have a motion and a second? I move we combine R349-22 to R351-22. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? They're combined. Motion carries. Mr. Clerk. Resolution 352-22, authorizing the purchase of electricity supply services for buildings within the city of Plainfield. Are there any questions? Motion. Is, is there a second? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Mr. Clerk, I think we're, I believe we're at 353. 353 22 authorizing the purchase of electricity supply services for electricity street lights. Uh, Are there motion, any questions? Motion to approve our, or combine R353 22 with through R358 22. Is there a second? Second. Uh, All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposing? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Mr. Clerk. Resolution 359-22 authorizing the purchase of four Chevy Tahoes and five Chevy Malibus for the Plainfield Police Department. Any questions, colleagues? Yes. Go right ahead, Councilwoman Davis. B.A. Levinson, um, you said that he was looking to move to electric cars or move to a more hybrid um, fleet. Are any of these cars that we're looking to purchase hybrid, electric, or any of the sort? The ones that we're getting for the inspectors are the 21 that we talked about. I can't remember what meeting that was. I don't believe these are, Director Abney, but I know that these are available much quicker than the ones that we're going for. I can speak on this. We're, we're getting these vehicles based on, on a need-based basis. The, uh, the Tahoes will actually be here in November. They are not hybrids or electrical or anything of the sort. The Malibus we'll be getting in February to early March. We're making that purchase, as, as I said, as we 
are out re-outfitting our fleet uh, and moving away from the uh, gas guzzling Crown Vicks and other vehicles that we have that are just, they're just bad vehicles. Add to the bone, uh, Director? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> A lot of them are parked outside right now. Any more questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. Is this, <clears throat> do these costs include um, uh, outfitting them inside? Uh, no, sir, they do not. Okay, so they'll have another period of yes, time where the, they have to go and have that done? Yes, it's usually, it's, it's a short time. Uh, usually it's about a month or so, but yes, there is some okay. time involved in it. And, and all nine of these, the Malibus and the Tahoes are, are going to be assigned to the police department? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? If there aren't any, may I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposing? Any abstaining? Motion carries. R360-22, Mr. Clerk. 360-22, authorizing the award of a professional services contract to the Lewis Consulting Group. Are there any questions, colleagues? If there are none, do we have a motion and a second, please? Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposing? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Mr. Clerk? 361-22, designating 1112 North Urban Renewal LLC as redeveloper for the redevelopment of certain properties. Are there any questions? I need a motion and a second, please. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Uh, any, op any opposing? Any abstaining? If not, motion carries. Mr. Clerk. Resolution 362-22, authorizing an increase in the previously awarded professional services contract with the Nishuane Group. Questions? Can I have a motion and a second? Motion. Moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposing? Opposed. Any abstaining? Mr. Clark, do we need a roll call? I got uh, six in favor, one opposed by Councilman McKenna. This resolution passes. Thank you. 363 22. Resolution 363-22, directing the planning board to prepare a redevelopment plan for properties identified on the tax map of the city of Plainfield as block 837, lot one, which is 117 through 127 East 7th Street. Are there any questions or comments? Council President, may I speak on this resolution? Please, Director. Okay. Um, what I have to say is uh, this resolution involves Grace Church Grace Church is being sold by the church and approved by the Diocese of New Jersey. Uh, there are Director Jackson, can you say that line again? Yeah. Grace is doing what? Grace Church is being sold by the church and it was approved by the Diocese of New Jersey. Uh, there are prospective buyers for this property. The diocese and the church will determine the handling of internal interior furniture and fixtures, including the Carolyn, the stained glass windows, and the organ. And they had, I, I, I'm sorry, they are handling what? They handle the uh, disposition. Okay, go ahead. Of interior furnishings and mm -hmm. fixtures, okay. including the Carolyn, the stained glass windows, and the organ. The okay. Grace Ch Church congregation has moved to St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Plainfield. Mm -hmm. A 2021 building inspection report done by the diocese revealed dangerous health and safety issues, including asbestos in all areas of the building, lead paint, mold, and exterior and interior structural deficiencies. And this was done when? This was done in 2021 by the diocese. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the planner for the city has noted, noted many of these same deficiencies on an interior inspection. Uh, the current zoning uh, for Grace Church is uh, TODD-TD, which permits the following uses, mixed use structures, apartments, townhouses, childcare, retail, personal service, 
office, art studio, art gallery, museum, restaurant, tavern, bank, health and fitness club, banquet hall, parking lot, laundromat, nursing home, adult daycare facility, assisted living facility, funeral home, house of worship, fraternal organization, open space. So those are all the permitted uses under the current zoning, okay? The city would like the church preserved and adaptively, adaptively reused. The city would like to do what, uh, Director Jackson? Would like the church preserved, number one, mm -hmm. and adaptively reuse the structure. And by including the property in a redevelopment area and plan, the city can prescribe and narrow the permitted uses for this property. Although the planning board did not recommend that the property be in an area in need of redevelopment, the property meets the destination criteria. Because the property is part of the urban enterprise zone, rehabilitation plan, city council can direct the planning board to create a redevelopment plan for the property without designating it as an area in need of redevelopment. The legislation before you tonight directs the planning board to create a redevelopment plan. If the city takes no action, the property will continue to be blighted and continue to go downhill and it will cost the city in terms of us having to deal with all of the property maintenance issues, the blight and the homelessness. So I'm not arguing with anybody. These are just the facts. Right now, there are a number of permitted uses uh, that don't require our approval. Thank you. Thank you, Director Jackson. Are there any questions uh, from the, uh, the floor, colleagues? Yeah, I have a question regarding- Go right ahead, hey, Councilman McKenna, go right. Go right I don't ahead. know if that was a, the first part of that, Director Jackson, was from the, a statement from the diocese regarding yes. the, the Carillon Bells and the internal fixtures that they would take care of them. They are the ones, it is their property. And as a private property owner, they are responsible for the handling of those particular items. And I don't know what that means. That means uh, they could sell them, they could move them somewhere else, or they can do what they want with those items. Uh, Ms. Cordidio, would you I like to know. chime in to, to help that? out with that question or no? Did she? Just here if you have a question, Mr. Council President. Okay. All right. Thank you. So my, I just got to make a statement then. My statement is that even though there are permitted uses on that property now, and they could, a developer could move forward with, with, uh, with something if they wanted to, if they purchase it from the diocese, that does not mean we need to, uh, to, to step aside and let them do that and not try to, to preserve um, our history, which is you know one of the things that we're so proud about talking about. And I think that we need to start making an effort to do it, even if the zoning currently would allow something like that. So I, I think if the planning board says they don't submit it as an area in need of redevelopment, then we should listen to our planning boards or we can have an ordinance and get rid of them too. But that's my two cents. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Councilwoman Davis? I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so Director Jackson, you said that the area is currently zoned for a number of different things, but also in previous meetings, you said that part of that structure is like a historic or on the historic registry or something. Um, so even if it's zoned for the various things that you listed, how does that affect the fact that it's also a historic structure, or at least part of it is a historic structure? Okay, so according to our consultant and others, it's private property. Uh, under the private <coughs> property, rules, they could go as far as to de demolish the property. So because it's private property, they could demolish it. But in previous meetings, 
We I said we don't support that. We can but right, but I believe you mentioned that the sanctuary or something was on the historic register. So is that not the case, or does that not matter because it's private property? It doesn't matter because it's private property. So if it doesn't matter because it's private property, then why do we have things designated as historic sites or on historic registers? Because we want to preserve them. We want the historic designation. Uh, the, those are all the typical reasons that we have. Plus they want historic money to preserve it. Uh, but what I'm saying is without a redevelopment plan, we can't prescribe that it should be adaptively reused and how that would work. Because more. right now they could take the building, leave it as is and put a laundromat in there. It's so, a use. Director, what you're saying is this redevelopment plan that the planning board is gonna do will have elements in it that will preserve uh, the historic section of the church. Yes, that's the, that's, that's what we're trying to do. Yes. That's the goal. Development zoning. Yes. That's the goal. <laughs> any other questions? If there aren't any, uh, I need a motion and a second. Move. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No. Are there any abstaining? Uh, I oppose as well. Sorry. Okay, Mr. Clerk, can I have a roll call, please, on this? Council members Briggs Jones. No. Davis. No. Hockaday. Yes. McKenna. No. Mills Ransom. Yes. Vice President McCray. Yes. Council President Good. Yes. Four in favor. Three opposed. Resolution has been adopted. Please proceed, uh, Mr. Clerk. Resolution 364 designating is that they're true, New Jersey LLC as redeveloper for certain properties in the city of Plainfield. Anyone have any questions about this? I, I just have one comment. Go right well, I ahead. Two questions. Go ahead, um, Councilman McKenna. If if my research is accurate, they're a true. Is it? Georgia company, well, they're a, they have a New Jersey filed legal entity, but they're a Georgia company. Um, they're also the owners of the various square uh, cannabis license holders that are going to operate out of that location. Uh, yes. And, oh, go ahead. You know, I could do it in two parts. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. And then um, the way that I read when I went, read through the, the, um, development agreement. Well, I have a couple of points here. One, again, we're doing uh, best efforts to hire lo local temporary and permanent jobs with a goal of 20%, but it's best efforts. There's no requirement. And then we ask for quarterly reports if asked by the city. Otherwise, we'll get them twice a year um, on how many they hired. But I think the interesting thing is that the ownership of this entity was only required to report ownership if they have 6% or more ownership. There's one gentleman who's the CEO of Thera, Thera, Thera True, who has 61% ownership, then his COO or vice president, and I guess a, probably an owner in that as well, has 6% ownership. So that is 67% ownership. The remaining 33 is held by people with 5% or less ownership, because we only ask it only reports on their 6% or more ownership. Just an aside, on our public disclosures, we only have to disclose if we own 5% or more of a corporation. So I find it interesting that 33% of this company is owned by at least six people. So I'm just pointing that out. But then the last part's a statement, the first two are just questions. Okay. So in terms of TheraTrue, uh, think of TheraTrue as in this particular case as the landlords. So they are actually purchasing property from the city and that this agreement is for them to build the facility. So they're going to purchase it and they're going to build this facility that would house uh, other cannabis uh, groups 
uh, that they are sponsoring. Remember I said before that they are financing the companies, that they are also giving them the technical support and providing them with space. So they're, in this case, Theratrue is the big landlord of the property. So like in town, if somebody wants to open up a cultivation center in the Mack Truck building, for example, they're leasing space. So think of Theratrue in this example as a landlord. And this agreement with them is between the city and the landlord. We will have agreements with each operator that you've already approved uh, as operators uh, for that particular building. We will have social equity agreements with each one of those business operators per our cannabis ordinance. And, and how much ownership does Theratrue have in each one of those the Square LLCs, because their website talks about how they own Square. So, uh, and I don't mean Square for people listening. To, to I would have sales. to, Jen, I don't know if you have any additional, I don't think they own anything. Jen, you, uh, in the uh, other companies, uh, Jen, you want to speak to that? I know they are affiliated director. I don't have the ownership percentages um, handy, uh, councilman, but each of those entities will be coming before the city for licensure. Uh, under the cannabis ordinance. And, you know, that's a, a very, um, very appropriate question for us to consider at that time. Mr. I'm um, sorry, Councilman McKenna, just um, on the percent ownership, generally under redevelopment agreements, what we ask for is at least 10%. Um, that is consistent with, uh, for example, what is required to be disclosed under the long-term tax exemption law and also with respect to municipal land use law applications here, because they had one gentleman who owned 6%, even though it was under 10, it was like the next um, most significant owner. They disclosed that one as well, even though he was under 10%. So that's why the, um, that's why like sort of the odd cutoff. It was originally- No, I, I, I understand the, the, what we usually get. I was just pointing out that on our public disclosures as elected officials, we only have to disclose ownership in, at 5% or more. So some of us could own some of that. That was it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Director Jackson. Any more questions or comments? If there aren't any colleagues, I need a motion and a second for R364-22. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. Six in favor, one opposed. Councilman McKenna opposed. Mm -hmm. uh, point of order before we move to the next item um i believe under the i hate to go back to what we already did but i believe under the mayor and business administrator items on the agenda we grouped those together as a consent agenda but we didn't have a unanimous vote so from uh the city clerk's own uh correction of the earlier vote do we have to do that vote over as well mr jello Tape I would say yes. If it wasn't so unanimous. If the vote was not unanimous and it was uh, blocked, then it must be uh, voted on or separated out in some way as to have unanimous vote on those items which could be unanimous. Can I just yes. I, my notes show our 347 and 348-22 was a six to one. I just wanna make sure we're in DC in order and we are being fair across the board. So we need to separate those two. So you need a motion to approve 347. Motion to approve 347-22. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Opposed. Six in favor, one opposed with Councilwoman Davis and resolution 348. Motion to approve 348-22. Second. All Aye. in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. I have that as a unanimous vote. Thank you, Councilman Davis. No problem. As long as you know, we're fair across the board. Uh, I don't believe we finished with 364-22, did we? We did. Six to one. Six to one. Okay. Mr. Clerk, please proceed.
Resolution 365-22, designating 163 East Front Street, Urban Renewal LLC as redeveloper and authorizing the execution of a redevelopment agreement. Colleagues, questions? I need a motion and a second, please. So um, moved. Uh, okay. Um, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Six in favor, one opposed, with Councilman McKenna opposing. Resolution passes. Proceed. And resolution 366-22, authorizing approval for a street opening at 1121 Denmark Road by PSC and G. Motion to approve R366-22. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries. We now uh, get to the introduction of ordinances on the first reading. Clerk, will you please read MC? 2022-48 by its title. MC 2022-48 is an ordinance of the City of Plainfield and the County of Union, authorizing an amendment to Plainfield City Code Section 17-9-24A, Cannabis-Related Businesses, Subsection B, Paragraph 2, Maximum Number of Facilities. Colleagues, do you have any questions? I have, I have a question. Go right ahead. How many of each license um, is how many of each licensed type operation is in operation currently? Uh, none of them are in operation currently. Okay, and and so until we, and this isn't a question. I I just think until we know how these are going to work, we've got a lot of them um, that have been approved. Whether or not they get through the final steps, I I just think we need to see what it is you know we're, we're dealing with before we start adding inventory i'd rather extend some liquor licenses quite honestly i wish we had more liquor licenses too uh, but as it relates to cannabis um we we picked the number five for regular uh licenses and we said for micro licenses that we would not um put a limit on it. So in the ordinance, as it stands today, there's no limit on micro licenses. Uh, there is a limit on regular licenses. And uh, what we have learned in this process is that the CRC, Cannabis Regulatory Commission, has their own approval list that is getting priority. And so what we've learned is that they have approved conditional licenses, whether <coughs> the applicant has talked to the town or not. So there are some approvals uh, for conditional licenses by the CRC where they have <coughs> not gone through uh, the other license application. So that's probably the best way to characterize it. So what you're saying is some of, well, two, two or more of the ones that we previously reviewed and approved and sent our approval to the state could get bumped because the state approved others we don't know about? Yes, I am saying that. Uh, the mayor uh, and I know both, how many? Um, um, In, uh, well, I get a, a formal letter from the CRC, the mayor and I, that's what prompted us to have this discussion because we're hearing people uh, that we hadn't heard of before. And so I, I do know that there are at least three that have been approved by the state. And I have voiced uh, concern on behalf of the administration as well as the mayor uh, did a week ago with the CRC about their process but uh, our complaints are falling on deaf ears. This is their process. Uh, it is defined as such. And uh, they have a limit uh, on uh, the number of regular licenses they will, lim uh, will uh, approve. And so the conditional license holders have a year 
uh, to get their operation up and running. So to give Plainfield a fair chance at being in the cannabis business game, uh, we felt it was prudent to increase that number so that we can elect some of the conditional, conditional license holders into the city of Plainfield. Now, I personally don't think that that's a bad thing uh, because, um, and you know, I heard uh, uh, Nancy Pewar's comments. I would say that um, uh, one property owner, uh, for instance, uh, is making a huge investment in the appearance of their building, in the exterior appearance of their building to accommodate cannabis cultivators. And that property owner is the Mack Truck Building. Uh, they have presented a wonderful a facade improvement plan to the city, to the uh, building and construction department. So uh, cannabis is bringing investment in as well as jobs. So let's not forget that these cultivation in particular, we had just decided to limit the number for five for all classes, one through four. And that would be cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and wholesale. So we had limited that to five. And so if we, you know, if uh, the owners of the Mack Truck Building see themselves as the premier location uh, for cannabis cultivation and manufacturing uh, in the state, uh, and there is a conditional, a very significant conditional license holder that was approved, uh, we should give them the opportunity here in Plainfield. Uh, Mack Truck was a conditional approval from the one, state? No, not the one. The one that you approved yeah. <laughs> that we supported was a regular license. The one that just got approved that we came to our attention uh, about a month and a half ago was approved by the CRC. And wh where's their intended location or do they have a year to figure that out? They, their intended location is the Mack Truck Building. <laughs> it's a huge building that's greatly underutilized. Uh, uh, direct this is a mess. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Uh, President, can uh, I go ask? Right, go uh, right ahead, uh, Councilwoman Mills Ransom. Okay. Uh, Director Jackson, I was going to ask, was this a good time to to, uh, to let the council, if they haven't seen it, and the public know about the cannabis conversation on October 13th? Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. we, uh, uh, this uh, is Thursday, right? October 13th yeah. from mm -hmm. 7 to 9 at yep. the Plainfield Performing Arts Center PPAC. will be the Plainfield Cannabis Conference. And uh, uh, Ernest Bennett and Sharon... Uh, have uh, done a wonderful job of putting a program together. We'll have people across the state uh, speaking to us at this cannabis conference, including a commissioner from the CRC. And okay. uh, thank you, Councilwoman Mills Ransom, for that. Welcome. Okay, we don't want to cut anybody off. Uh, if there are no other questions. I'm going to entertain a motion to adopt this ordinance on its first reading. Mm -hmm. I need a motion and a second, please. I move. Second. Mr. Clerk? Council members, Briggs Jones? Yes. Davis? Yes. Hockaday? Yes. McKenna? Yes. Mills Ransom? Yes. Vice President McCray? Yes. Council President Good? Yes. This ordinance has been introduced on first reading. Mr. Clark, MC 2022-49. MC 2022-49, an ordinance approving applications for tax exemption and financial agreement for payment in lieu of taxes for 163 East Front Street, Urban Renewal, LLC. Questions? I need a motion and a second, please. Moved. Mr. Jallo? Council members Briggs Jones. Yes. Davis. No. Hockaday. Yes. McKenna. No. Mills Ransom. Yes. Vice President McCray. Yes. Council President Good. Yes. 
Five in favor, two opposed. This ordinance has been introduced on first reading. Mr. Clark, please proceed with MC 2022-50. C2022-50, an ordinance to amend chapter six, building article two, property maintenance, amending registration requirements, levying a registration fee on owners and creditors of registrable properties. Council, any questions? Yes. Councilwoman Davis, go right ahead. Um, so who exactly would be required to pay these fees? Um, Cause I know some of it talks about foreclosed properties. Some of it talks about abandoned properties. So if the property is abandoned, who are we assessing the fee to? So uh, thank you uh, Councilwoman for that question. In most cases, it is the bank or financial institution or a, a holder of a uh, possible mortgage in cases where it is not. Um, we serve, that's why we use ProChamps to help us research to find out uh, who we can uh, attach those uh, fees to. Thank you. So my second question is under the penalties for not following this ordinance, uh, one of the potential penalties is imprisonment. So um, why is that a potential penalty? And if let's say a bank owns it, who do we then say, okay, you're the person who potentially gets in prison. Like, why is that even a, a penalty here? Well, we, we had to uh, model this ordinance. Uh, and that's why we're making a change based on what uh, the state is now requiring other municipalities to do. Uh, as for imprisonment, I'm not sure how that would play out, uh, to be quite honest with you. Uh, but certainly, uh, we have not had that situation where we've had to even think about it because most of the banks, once we notify them, uh, appropriately pay the fees um, or, or pay what they have to pay. So I, I can't speak to the imprisonment part, but I can certainly say that we've not uh, remotely uh, gotten to that point. Thank you. It's only a concern because if it's in the ordinance, that means it has the potential to happen. That's the only reason why I asked. But thank, thank you. you. Any more questions? If not, I'm going to entertain a motion to adopt this ordinance on its first reading. So moved. I second. Second. <laughs> Mr. Clerk. Next members, Briggs Jones. Yes. Davis. Yes. Hockaday. Councilman Hockaday. Yes. McKenna. Yes. Mills Ransom. Yes. Vice President McCray. Yes. Council President Good. Yes. It's unanimous. It's been introduced on first reading. Uh, Mr. Clark, please proceed with MC 2022-51. MC 2022-51 is an ordinance of the city of Plainfield, County of Union, New Jersey, rescinding resolution 279-20, ordinance 2021-16, and resolution 352-21 in connection with the redevelopment of block 836, lot one, eight through 1501 by PL 836 Plainfield LLC and a tax exemption granted to PL 836 Plainfield Urban Renewal LLC, along with all associated approvals and agreements. Colleagues, do you have any questions about this? Yes. It's our first reverse pilot. Uh, Councilwoman Davis, I believe you uh, had a question. I do have a question. So now what happens to these properties? Like what's next for all of these properties? Well, all of the properties involved uh, are privately owned. So that becomes a decision of the owner. So they will still pay conventional taxes, but all of the separate owners will still do whatever it is that they want to do with these properties. That's correct. Thank so you. I would state, uh, Councilwoman Davis, uh, they're the properties are still part of a redevelopment area. And certainly there's still an opportunity for another for the city to seek out another developer. Thank you. Is there a motion and a second on the floor? Move. Okay. Mr. Clerk? Council members Briggs Jones. Yes. Davis. Yes. Hockaday. Yes. Anna. Yes. Mills Ransom. Yes. Vice President McCray. Yes. Council President Good. Yes. That is unanimous. This ordinance has been introduced on first reading. We're moving down to general comments. Uh, and a total of 60 minutes has been allocated for all the public comments to be presented. And each speaker will be allocated five minutes. If you wish to be heard, 
please hit the hand icon to be recognized and you will be unmuted. Once you have been unmuted, please give your name and address for the record. And again, each speaker will be given three minutes. The floor is now open. Mr. Frazier, your name and address for the record again, please. Thank you. Uh, Ian Frazier, 747 Dixie Lane. Um, first, I urge the council and the administration as a symbol of goodwill to put forward a motion to purchase the Pittis family Carillon from the diocese and relocate it from Grace Church to a public space in Plainfield. Second, the 2021 inspection of Grace Church is not credible because the diocese used a home inspector who suspected upon sight that the floor of the sanctuary contained asbestos without taking real samples and testing them for asbestos. And it was part of a um, vote that was rejected by the planning board. Grace Church is a landmark under the HPC ordinance and that is grounds enough for the city to do the maximum it legally can to ensure its preservation. I am arguing also that the Carillon is an exterior feature of the building under the HPC ordinance as it can be viewed from the street through the slats of the tower and would be a violation if removed, along with the stained glass windows as the building is currently protected under the ordinance. Have they gone before, have the archdiocese gone before the HPC at any point to present their plan up until today? If I understand correctly, the city can withhold demolition permits or issue fines against violations. Can the city tell us if that is correct? Uh, that's for everybody to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. We appreciate your comments. Mrs. Burwinkle, good evening. Your name and address for the record, please. Hi, Mary Burwinkle, 1785 Sleepy Hollow Lane. I'm calling to express my regret for the approval of MC 2022-35. I think the changes weaken HPC and appear to favor developers rather than citizens and taxpayers. Um, the other point I would like to make is that, I think someone made this earlier, um, we all have to vote for city council members. And I would really like it if city council members had to give a rationale for the vote they're making on items like this. I was on zoning board for seven years and um, I was taught by Scott Beelan, who was our first chairman. Every time we voted, we have to get it, we had to give a substantive reason for why we were voting. So um, I, I really take I'm, I'm really sorry that people that I have to vote for are voting for stuff without giving me any rationale for why they're doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Burwinkle. David M., your name and address again for the record, please. David Martinek, 67 Washington Avenue, Morristown. And I'm here representing a nonprofit called Community in Crisis at 9 Church Street in Bernardsville. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to address the council member on this issue. I am a person along with 23 other Americans in long-term recovery from substance use disorder. I'm a retired corporate executive, a homeowner, taxpayer, and voter in all government elections. I'm an active member of the Morris County Chamber of Commerce, the Somerset County Business Partnership, board member, treasurer, advocate, and volunteer of grassroots nonprofit organizations that help individuals with substance use and mental health disorders. The importance of community and peer-led efforts have never been more apparent than it has in the last couple of years as we witness the intersection of the COVID pandemic and the opioid epidemic. The devastating result is more than 100,000 overdose deaths in, in 2021, and in New Jersey that equates to an average of 10 overdose deaths every day of the year. As this pandemic wanes, we are experiencing the depths of mental health and addiction as the community grapples with the associated traumas, not only of those that are overdosed, but those family members, loved ones that are affected by it. Recent data shows that 85% of the people who achieve five years of abstinence will succeed in staying that way for the rest of their, their lives. Recovery community organizations and peer recovery centers have been instrumental in creating an environment for sustaining long-term recovery.
peer recover recovery peers with lived experience complement the current professional services that are often overwhelmed. This success has elected officials and community leaders thinking well beyond detox and IOP centers, allowing peer recovery organizations to deliver scientifically proven solutions for our friends, family, and neighbors. The organization I mentioned earlier was awarded a community peer recovery center from a grant from uh, the New Jersey Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services early this year to provide peer-based recovery support services for all of Somerset County. This is one, this is an initiative where one peer recovery center was established in each of the 21 counties in New Jersey. As an effort to increase our reach in the county, we are proposed we we will be bringing a peer recovery pop-up event location to North Plainfield. <clears throat> the, the proximity of Plainfield to North Plainfield and other, uh, other surrounding communities is why I'm here this evening. This peer recovery center pop-up event is a supported, supportive, substance-free, safe, and non-judgmental environment where individuals can access peer support, related recovery services, information on substance use treatments, and connections to other community resources. All these activities are led by certified peer recovery specialists and volunteers with lived experience of substance use disorders, co-occurring mental health conditions, and multiple pathways to recovery. It is open to all individuals at all stages of recovery, from those making the initial steps to those maintaining an already successful recovery, as well as those family members and friends directly affected. It is a place for social connection and a place of belonging where participants can experience the process of recovery by fostering a sense of empowerment and independence. We will be providing one-on-one -on -one peer support, recovery coaching, mental health peer support will be on hand, community resource navigation, recovery meetings, education workshops and trainings, free Narcan kits and free wellness items. All of these things as a nonprofit are provided free of charge to the public. It will be held, our first event will be held on October 20th from 3 to 7 p.m. at the North Plainfield Community Center. Subsequent events will be held on the second Thursday of the month. I bring this to the attention, as I mentioned earlier, to, to the city of Plainfield and other surrounding communities. Oh, First of all, to, to announce the event, request that uh, your assistance in spreading the word of this event to those in need uh, through community networks, social media platforms that may be uh, issued by the City of Plainfield. I would appreciate any points of contact that can assist us in delivering this valuable service to the community. Um, I, I sent some information earlier by email and would be happy to uh, send it again if I could be provided with a point of contact. Uh, thank you for your time and appreciate this opportunity. David, thank you for that valuable information. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Owner, you are muted, but we need your name and address again for the record, please. Hi, good evening. Jeanette Crishone, 1410 Evergreen Avenue in Plainfield. Um, I just have a question. I'm curious about the vote on not having in-person council meetings. Um, Westfield, Clark, Scotch Plains, Fanwood, they all have either in-person or hybrid council meetings. So I'm just curious as to what our issue is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crishone. Dan Rossin, your name and address for the record, please. Hi, I'm Dan Rossin, 1220 Watchung Avenue, um, Plainfield. I'll be brief and direct. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the three council members tonight who voted in favor of returning to in-person meetings. Uh, the people of Plainfield are watching and voting. So thank you for that vote. Um, I am speaking tonight as a taxpayer 
that concerned voter of Plainfield to demand, not politely request, that city council begins live in-person meetings with a hybrid option immediately. The simple fact is that in the past month, since nearly a dozen people at the last council meeting were in per wanted in-person meetings and wanted to know when they would begin again, I have seen nearly every elected official on this call, including the mayor, at a social event or a community event indoors without masks. It is clear that COVID public safety protocols is not the reason why you continue to have city council meetings on Zoom. The lack of transparency and accountability to the residents of Plainfield by this elected governing body is unacceptable. And it will not be forgotten in future elections, just as it was not forgotten in the 2022 primaries, and it will not be forgotten in 2023. Thank you. Holly A, your name and address for the record, please. Hi, I'm Holly Algio. I'm in Edison, New Jersey, member of Grace Episcopal Church. And I am just wondering, firstly, I want to uh, reiterate that the economic development director has made false statements of the diocesan report or inspection report or whatever it is that shows asbestos, which does not show that any testing of asbestos has come back positive. Nothing has come back positive. I'm also wondering why the economic developer has waited seven months to ask the planning board to come up with a redevelopment plan if the city were interested in preserving the building a developer would have been found who would preserve that building. Right now, there's a developer who has not guaranteed that. So I'm also wondering who it is that um, will write up this plan. I, I just am not familiar with, I know you guys are working on the Todd report, uh, which is uh, planning development for the area, redevelopment for the entire area around Grace. Um, what I'm wondering is who differently is the planning board going to get, or who is going to come up with this plan? Is it a developer? Is it the planning board? Who will come up with this redevelopment plan to preserve grace? Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Michelle, good evening. Your name and address for the record, please. Yes, go ahead, Harvey. Yeah, um, <clears throat> my name is Harvey Judkins, uh, resident of 428 West 4th Street in Plainfield, New Jersey. I'm, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Mr. Juckins. Thank you for joining us. Right then. I just want to admit, uh, all these apartment buildings that are coming to Plainfield, are they all going to be in tax abatements? Can you answer that question for me? Uh, yes, um, someone will answer your questions after everyone has spoken, Mr. Juckins. Uh, well, thank you. I hope you get a good answer. Uh, yes. number, Number two, mm -hmm. uh, I can see the over overcrowding with all these apartment buildings, overcrowding the sewer systems, the city streets are getting mm -hmm. so overcrowded. It's like New York City. And in fact, the downtown area, you're looking downtown area, where I would come outside, looking at downtown area, I wouldn't come into the city. And it's, I've been a resident here for over 90 some years and Plainfield is going to hell as far as I'm concerned. It's like the rape of Plainfield and your councilmen are, are, have no backbone at all. You guys have no backbone. I served on a council back in the 60s and this back, you have no, you guys have no backbone. It's a kangaroo, kangaroo court and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. That's my, 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 my comments. You better shame yourself, shame on you. Okay, uh, Barbara Habib, your, yes. name and your name and address for the record, please. Good evening. Yes, my name is Barbara Habib. I'm from 73 Mountain Avenue in North Plainfield. And I have been a member of Grace Church for over 65 years. My family has been members of Grace Church. And um, Mother Carolyn, who was the pastor, went through great pains to put that church on the national and the state historic registries, okay? I uh, called the national, I, I called both of them, I called the state and the national historic commissions 
to find out what could be done to preserve the buildings. And I was told in no uncertain terms that it's up to the city of Plainfield and the historic commission to preserve that building. It has nothing to do with the state. It has nothing to do with the National Historic Commission and it has nothing to do with the uh, diocese. It has to do with the city of Plainfield. If the city of Plainfield wishes to keep that building intact, you have the power to do so. So I believe that uh, Ms. Jackson is uh, wrong on what she says. Um, I think there's a couple of facts that are not correct. And uh, again, the, the burden lies on the city of Plainfield to preserve the integrity of the building. And I'm imploring you, I, have, I, I am in tears. This is my church and I'm not a member of St. Mark's Church and I will not be a member of St. Mark's Church. Grace Episcopal Church was my church and that is still my church. And I'm praying and hoping that you guys will preserve that beautiful, beautiful building because once that's gone, you can't get that back. That's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Denise Edmonds, good evening. Your, your name and address for the record, please. Good evening again, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Edmonds, good evening. Your name and address, please. Yes, it's 975, hold on a second. Get some feedback. It's 975 Hillside Avenue. Yes, good evening. I would, good evening. I'd like to thank Dan Rosen for his comment and just add that teachers have been back to school, um, which are notorious germ factories for over a year now. I know this because I am a teacher and I see lots of teachers every day. And I believe it is time for this council to get back in person. I also think that it should remain hybrid for the people of the city to be able to attend um, if they can't get to the building on time. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brown, good evening. Your name and address for the record, please. Good evening. My name is Laura Miranda Brown and I'm at 1345 Highland Avenue. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I would like to once again um, say how disappointed I am that the council has chosen to undermine the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, and I think then with the additional vote to allow um, the, South, the Todd South Avenue rules to go into effect that will uh, directly impact a property on Crescent is just another example of why it's so important to have a Historic Preservation Commission in the first place. Um, it, is a, it is such an asset to our city to have these beautiful areas. Um, it's a real loss when these things disappear as others have noticed. Once these buildings are gone, you're not getting them back. I'm sure everyone knows. If any, if you've seen construction of single family homes in the last two years, the quality of the materials are much lower. We all know why, supply chain and costs. The materials that were used in these homes cannot be purchased. You can't, you just can't find it anymore. So once they're, once they're gone, they're gone. So I, I am very disappointed in that. I'm also hoping that the council will be coming forward or the administration will be coming forward in the next couple of weeks with, um, the outcomes of the community meetings that have taken place around the mayor's center of excellence. I was able to attend one as the mayor's uh, weekly email noted, it was a robust conversation. We are, we residents and citizens pay taxes. We pay a lot of property taxes um, and we are very concerned about what the cost of renovating rehabilitating and creating programming at the YMCA building that we now are on the hook for. We've spent $5 million of the city's money and that is clearly going to be a drop in the bucket. And I am anxious to learn what the community's feedback has been and how that will then inform the next steps because nobody in town, I think is really interested in, in seeing our property taxes go up by any, by any amount, frankly. Um, so I'd love to know when the city council or the administration has a plan to roll out the public comments and what those plans will be and what the cost will be. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Piwar, 
Good evening again. Yeah, good, good evening. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you were 11:29 Merle Avenue. I'll try to be brief. Um, my concern about Grace Church, and I didn't hear anybody mention it. Um, there is a memorial garden there, and I would hope that um, plans would be put in there, um, in whatever is decided, to make sure that's either preserved or properly taken care of, because um, a lot of people's ashes are there, and um, it would just be um, not a good thing if somebody was to build upon it without properly disposing and taking care of the ground that people's remains are uh, scattered across. My other question is, it's talked that Grace is a, is a piece of pro private property. I can go back and I know people are gonna cringe when I say this. I can go back to when Muhlenberg was a piece of private property. And before the sale of Muhlenberg, because it was a nonprofit went through, it had to go before the superior court and the attorney general had to step in and, and, and make a decision. And I'm wondering if the same things has to occur with Grace Church since um, Grace Church is a nonprofit and I'm not sure whether the Institutional Funds Act comes into play about endowments and trusts and things like that. And I would just be concerned that um, I hope somebody notified the attorney general's office so that they could weigh in because I wouldn't want to see the city go down the road and then find out and even Grace Church go down the road and then to come to find out that uh, the brakes have to be put on whatever's going to happen because the attorney general's office was not notified. Um, I, I use Muhlenberg as an example. Um, the city did have to, the city didn't weigh in on that. Um, private citizens did weigh in on it, but Muhlenberg had to go before the Superior Court in order to uh, um, sell the property and to um, transfer funds. Um, and I just want to make the city aware of that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. P. War. Have a good night. Thank you. Ms. Brenda Gilbert, good evening. How are you? Your name and address for the record, please. 1208 East Front Street. Good evening to all of you. Good evening. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Ms. Gilbert. Very good, very good. Um, I first want to talk about Grace Episcopal Church. Um, I don't know how you all are planning to proceed with the conversation about Grace Episcopal Church, but I would, would hope that you would maybe include some of the people from the religious community because it's a possibility that some smaller churches could come together and form a community church and repurpose the building and continue to use it for the use that it was established for. I also want to talk about the rescue squad. I'm trying to find out from the city council, as well as the administration, what is going to happen in terms of the rescue squad? I have real problems that we have spent five plus million dollars for this YWCA, and none of this money was, 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 was allocated for the rescue squad. And now here we are, a community with no medical entities available to us, and the rescue squad has been put on pause. I want to know what's going to happen. What does the city council, what does the mayor plan to do in terms of helping this rescue squad uh, uh, get itself together so that it can once again serve this community as it should. Now, I'm saying all of this, realizing that I'm not gonna get an answer. So I'm basically saying this to the people of the city of Plainfield. A lot of things have been happening we have not been getting the answers, nor the, 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 the things that we need. We haven't been getting the answers. We haven't been seeing the actions that we need from our city council, as well as our administration. So we, the people of the city of Plainfield, are going to have to band together and form our own action committee, okay? And perhaps go outside of our city council and our administration to get some answers to our questions. Um, maybe then somebody will hear us. Maybe then somebody will understand that we are important. Maybe then somebody will understand that we are the voters. Maybe then somebody will understand that we are the taxpayers and stop increasing our taxes without giving us services. Somewhere or another, we have to stop this roller coaster. We have uh, to stop. 
so, yes, sir. Um, Ms. Gilbert, normally I would not, uh, I didn't want you to hang up, but would, uh, would you please stay on the line after you're done? Because uh, something will be addressed of one of the uh, things that you mentioned. So just okay, want to let you know good. not to hang up. Mm -hmm. But I'm still, I'm still saying to the people of the city of Plainfield, okay, it, it's like we're going to have to become our own government, okay? Because we're not holding our city officials' feet to the fire. So it seems like to me they feel like that they don't have to function and service us as they should. So uh, I'll talk to all of you about that later. Thank you, Mrs. Gilbert. Hopefully you'll stay on the line. Ms. Ferroni, good evening again. Hi. So um, I agree with Brenda Gilbert on everything she said about healthcare. Uh, and also the, there should have been an attempt and there can there should be a continued attempt actually there, they should try to sell the church to another church that should be the first thing that they do the city of plainfield should not be encouraging redevelopment of this church it's an incredibly valuable church the interior and the exterior i don't know why you don't understand that anyway krista lawrenson wrote a beautiful uh, story about grace church about the architects Texture so that maybe we could educate you a bit, a bit. Grace was designed by renowned architect Robert W. Gibson. 11 of Gibson's works have been listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Six more are designated New York City landmarks. Some of his buildings still function in their originally intended purposes, while many have been repurposed to beautiful effect. Here are just a few. The striking St. Michael's Episcopal Church, which is filled with Tiffany windows and mosaics, uh, and they're, they're actually working with partners for sacred places to preserve their church, which is what we want Grace Episcopal Church to do. And that's what the city should have encouraged Grace Episcopal Church to do. Instead of predatorially swooping down to say, hey, let's develop it into apartments, okay. Uh, and also the West End, that was my, that was not what Chris just said, that's what I say. Getting back to what Chris just said, and the West End Collegiate Church, both in Manhattan. The Episcopal Cathedral of All Saints in Albany, New York, which was attended by J.P. Morgan and Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. The cathedral is now a noted tourist destination for its Gothic architecture and stained glass windows. And Grace Episcopal Church has better stained glass windows than that one does. Uh, the cathedral is a concert venue for both secular and religious music. It has been cited as one of the great acoustic spaces in the US and Canada. And we have to think of churches as wonderful acoustic spaces. Um, I can't continue reading this because something popped up. But anyway, I can't continue reading her story. Uh, but this architect is very important and the city should be working to preserve the interior and exterior of the church. And I don't understand why the city council does not understand that. Why don't you understand? This is theft from a black community. I'll put it right out there to you. Theft from a black community, just like Muhlenberg Hospital was theft from a black community. I just don't understand why you're letting this happen. So sorry, I can't continue to read the story. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lorenzen, uh, your name and address for the record, please. Hi, my name is Christian Lawrenson. I live at 308 West 8th. Um, I'll continue what um, Elizabeth was saying. Um, so some more of this architect's uh, famous buildings are the Episcopal Cathedral of All Saints in Albany, New York, which was attended by J.P. Morgan and Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. The cathedral is now a noted tourist attraction for its Gothic architecture and stained glass windows. It's a concert venue for secular and religious music and has been cited as one of the great acoustic spaces in the US and Canada. Gibson designed the Morton Plant House on Manhattan's Fifth Avenue, which is intended to rival the neighboring homes of the Vanderbilts and Astors. In 1917, it was repurposed as the famous Cartier flagship store. There's also the Snug Harbor Music Hall on Staten Island. In 2019, the city of New York expanded and renovated the hall to bring the music venue into the 21st century. One of my favorite Gibson buildings is the Church Missions House in New York City. My husband and I lived near this building for 12 years before moving to Plainfield and got to admire its beauty on a daily basis. Some of you may recognize it as the famous building featured in Netflix's Inventing Anna. 
The Mission House was home to nonprofits from the 1890s until recent times. In 1963, the last nonprofit bought the building for 350,000 and spent 560,000 renovating it. These costs were covered by fundraising. In 2014, a realty company purchased the building for $50 million. The building now houses the Fotografiska Photography Museum, as well as one of Manhattan's most stunning restaurants, Veronica. In 2021, the old chapel was converted into a high-end cocktail bar. RFR Realty is now looking to sell the building for $135 million. So these are valuable, valuable pieces of architecture. And of course, there's our beautiful Grace Episcopal Church, which was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2002 for its significance in architecture, art, and music. As you can see, Gibson's works are American architectural masterpieces. They are sought after real estate, and when done right through thoughtful restoration and design, they can be repurposed into valuable assets for a city. They can be converted into concert venues, tourist attractions, museums, restaurants, and event spaces. Many of these buildings have been renovated through grants. Grace has received restoration grants in the past and no doubt can benefit from them again. While researching Gibson's works, I came across articles lamenting the destruction of some of his buildings, which were replaced by unmemorable facades that existed to enrich the developers who built them, not to beautify the cities they reside in. One example is the gorgeous New York Clearinghouse, which was described at the time as being reminiscent of the grand Renaissance, Renaissance structures of Rome. The Times wrote about its demise in an article headlined, Architectural Treasures Give Way to Stark Boxes. At the same time, plans were being laid for the demolition of Penn Station. The destruction of these buildings led New York to create the Landmarks Preservation Commission. If this hadn't happened, Grand Central would have also been destroyed. The Times editorial stated at the time, any city gets what it wants, is willing to pay for, and ultimately deserves. Plainfield deserves better than the destruction of our historical treasures under the guise of progress. Grace was named to the National Register of Historic Places for a reason, to preserve it from facing the same fate as many of America's lost architectural gems. Mayor Mapp's recent State of the City was entitled Plainfield, From Rebellion to Renaissance. The Renaissance was a period of cultural, artistic, political, and economic rebirth. It promoted the rediscovery of classical art. Destroying a historic work of art like Grace in favor of cheap, mundane apartments is antithesis to a renaissance. It's developmental malpractice, plain and simple. When asked about the future of grace, Mayor Mapp has said it's up to the church. The church says it's up to the city. Developers can't demolish grace or impede on its green space without the city's approval. You are the gatekeepers of our beautiful city. Please don't repeat past mistakes. Please don't let Plainfield's architectural treasures give way to stark boxes. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. With there being uh, no more for public comment, public comment is closed. Members of the uh, cabinet, uh, the questions that need to be answered, hopefully you have been taking notes. Uh, we'll start with UBA Levinson. Um, do you have any comments for Mrs. Gilbert? Okay, um, I believe this is about the Plainfield Rescue Squad. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I mean, I'm sorry, pardon me. <laughs> so I will I'll speak to that. I will tell you that um, the administration was not aware until last Monday. So we found out on Monday, October 3rd, through hearsay, actually, that the Plainfield Rescue Squad was no longer operational. We didn't get confirmation of that until I think Monday afternoon. Um, and since then, I have been working with the county, JFK, South Plainfield, and the River Road Rescue Squad. I've had multiple conversations with each of those entities almost on a daily basis to ensure that there is coverage in Plainfield 24 seven during this time when the rescue squad is not operational. I have not heard from the rescue squad, but I do have a meeting with them on Wednesday, tomorrow, um, which Director West set up. And at that meeting, I, I'm curious to hear what's going on with them. Um, all What we've been doing is just maintaining service in the city uh, during their absence. 
In terms of the issue related to uh, why we haven't been funding them, I think that's what the implication was. I have made clear in other council meetings that we've had that when we first got our ARPA, the first tranche of money in 2021, it's always been on our very forefront of our mind to carve out money directly for the Plainfield Rescue Squad. However, since 2021, this has been conditional upon their submission to a financial audit so that we can make sure that where we're giving our funds is appropriate. And so we had been reaching out to them, our auditor reached out to them, I had a face-to-face -face meeting, I had multiple follow-ups, they've not submitted to an audit and therefore we're unable to provide them with that funding. So right now I am looking at both short-term solutions to get us through this time and luckily the county and JFK have been excellent partners with me on this. And I'm also looking at a longer term solution, um, more to be determined on that. But if, if the question is one of funding, uh, it was never, it was not the city's intent not to provide funding. However, you know, we do have a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that our funding is going somewhere that can pass an audit. PA Levinson, how close are we are to it for a long term solution? For a long and, and, and the short term, can you elaborate on the short term a little bit more, please? So the short term solution is that um, Andrew Moran, the director of public safety for the county and I, as well as Mark Border at JFK have been speaking regularly. They've, they're working together to create 24 seven coverage in Plainfield, which we do have right now. I also had a call this morning with the DA from South Plainfield to ensure that the South Plainfield Rescue Squad is responding to our calls, which they are as well. And as you all know, we have River Road, that rescue squad also on call here. So we have four rescue squads that are aware of our situation and that are working together to collaborate and make sure that we have no gaps in coverage. That's the short term plan. Obviously, that's not sustainable in the long term because these are other entities that are providing services to us that. Um, you know, on, on a crisis basis, essentially. So I am working on a more long-term solution. It will be interesting when I meet with the rescue squad tomorrow to hear if they have a long-term solution in terms of their sustainability, but I am working on alternatives should we, should we get to that point. Thank you. Uh, Director Jackson, anything in closing that you'd like to uh, respond to the uh, open public comment that we had? Yeah, the only, uh, just a couple of comments. One is I've been clear that the administration's position is uh, the adapted reuse of Grace uh, Church. Uh, so I definitely wanted to say that again. I do encourage the public who had a lot of comments for the uh, governing body and for me also to share their concerns with the church and with the diocese of New Jersey. So if there are ideas uh, to save the church in terms of grants, funding, uh, other ideas, I think that should be shared with the church and with the diocese. Uh, they are pretty strong in their position as well as the public is strong in its position. So again, the city will move forward with the redevelopment uh, planning activity to present back to council before the planning board. Uh, and that we will, um, we will come back to council with what we think would be an appropriate redevelopment plan for that area, uh, including the adaptive reuse of the church. Uh, someone asked who would be doing that. Uh, the way it works is the city uh, Department of Economic Development is responsible for putting together the plan uh, for consideration uh, by the planning board. Uh, we use the consulting group uh, Nisha Wayne uh, to do that uh, currently. So uh, I've answered that question. As it relates to tax abatements, uh, 
you know, we could spend a lot of time on it. Tax abatements uh, is kind of a misnomer. It's payments in lieu of taxes. So it's not that these developers are not paying something. It is payments in lieu of taxes. And the way we structure these pilots uh, that we present to council is uh, we're always getting more money than we previously did in the prior tax year. And uh, certainly I could do a whole forum on pilots. Uh, in terms of the Center for Excellence, uh, we did have two community make meetings. Uh, we thank you for your participation in uh, the Center for Excellence uh, uh, focus group. Uh, in addition to that particular group, uh, we have done surveys. Uh, and so we're still compiling the data. We will share the data via uh, the city's website, our findings uh, in terms of what you have told us uh, that you wanted to see. So the surveys are really the quantitative piece and the uh, community meetings that we held are the qualitative piece. We were able to do a deeper dive into some of the questions that we had for you related to programming. So I think I've answered uh, everything that was addressed to me, Council President. Thank you, appreciate all uh, of your responses to the questions. Uh, uh, so if there be nothing else. Also, uh, Council President, there was, according to my notes from public comment, there was one thing skipped and the gentleman, um, David M, who what, is what working was, with the what, what peer. Was, what was it? The, the peer counseling um, mm -hmm. group that is gonna have an event in North Plainfield. He asked for a contact, contact at yes, the city, I assume it'd be Director Brown. So can we get David M that info? Uh, Director Brown, would you be able to give that information? And so, if Mr. Brown, he is I'm, I'm sorry, still on. He's, yeah, he's still locked in. Mr. David M. Is. Yeah, sure. Give give him a contact, some yeah. type of contact information, so that he can reach directly out with that information that he supplied us with on this evening. Sure, he can email Shep S H E P dot Brown B R W N at PlainfieldNJ.gov. Once again, Shep S H E P dot Brown. BRWN at plainfieldnj.gov. Thank you, Director Brown. We appreciate you. Uh, as we say, uh, uh, all heart. I had uh, one question and one comment. Sure. Uh, my question is for BA Levinson. Um, are there other municipalities who do not have volunteer rescue squads? And how do they handle those situations when they uh, don't have volunteer squads? Do they just have paid squads or how does that, are there other municipalities who have no rescue squad whatsoever? Yes, and there's multiple, uh, there's multiple for, the word I'm looking for, there are multiple ways to do it. So there are places that go out to bid and pay for a service, whether it's from Robert Wood Johnson or JFK or any of those big providers. Either they pay a lump sum or they're able to get it where, you know, they just, they, the provider just bills for the service. They bill the resident, you know, based on their insurance. So there are quite a few municipalities. I, 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 and I believe South Plainfield also just broke off from their volunteer rescue squad. And now they have 24 seven coverage from RW. From RW. So from Robert Woods. So yes, there's there's many ways to do it without a municipal volunteer rescue squad. And there are many municipalities that are doing that. Piscataway uh, went out for RFP, I believe two years ago, and they're paying JFK to handle their municipality. Um, that's one that's paid on top of the billing. Uh, the South Plainfield one is just billing. But yes, I've been looking at all, all the different avenues. Thank you. Uh, 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 go ahead. So my next question is, now that it's been voted down by the council for us to not go back in person, is it safe to assume that for the rest of this year, we will be meeting virtually? That's not a question for me. No, that's yeah. not me. Uh, no, it's not safe to assume. So there are plans for the council to meet in person before the year is up. 
it's it's a strong possibility councilwoman davis and you will know in plenty of time like plenty of time like before the next meeting kind of is what you said last meeting well it bears repeating councilman mckenna okay but councilwoman you davis to answer your meeting. question to, so, so to answer your question you will be notified soon okay <laughs> okay sure <laughs> yeah, thank you so. thank you very much you'll know when you know that's when you'll know are you good motion to adjourn so moved second all in favor aye any opposed any abstaining colleagues good night cabinet members good night <laughs>